Hey witches, it's Lee and this is Do The Magical Thing and this is part of the Do The Magical Thing With series and we've got the wonderful <laughs> Yes, I'm very excited. It's been a long time coming, I think, and I've always appreciated the support of the channel myself and um, and yeah, it's just really exciting. So introduce yourself. Hi. <laughs> um, I am Haley J. Uh, pronouns are they and she, whichever. Um, they is always appreciated. She is fine. <laughs> um, long time watcher and absorber of do the magical thing. Um, I, at some point, I will be able to iterate to you how important your content has been to the development of my practice. <laughs> Oh, but I, um, I call myself a hedge witch. Um, I know that there are different, um, different definitions of that. Um, I claim it as sort of the, I like alleys. I like hedgerows. I like liminal weird kind of spaces, um, that are less trafficked and I don't know. I find them more interesting. So. Yeah, I like that liminality aspect. That's really cool. Yeah. 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 Um, during the day, I make soap and I sell it on the internet. Um, and you and I are on the planning team for Critical Thinking Witch Collective, yeah. which I'm is so delightful. Yeah. That's been such a great experience. Um, and I have finally gotten my act together and I've started a Substack. It's called Here Be Hedge Witches. Um, it's very small. I am keeping my goals very low key right now because I'm sure as you know, as soon as we get an idea, we launch into things like, yes, I'm going to post every three days. It's going to be amazing. And within two weeks, you've completely burnt yourself out and it gathers dust. And my goal is for it to not do that. Um, I've written fairly transparently on um, my personal and my business social media about my witchy development. Um, but I like the idea of diving into longer format a little mm -hmm. bit um, and just really honestly not typing on my phone and <laughs> having, having a little bit more space, both, both literally and figuratively um, to just sort of explore where my head is currently at in terms of my witchcraft practice so. yeah yeah that makes sense yeah. what about that sort of liminality or those kind of less trodden places really appeals to you do you think oh are we going to get real real quick we are <laughs> you get deep it's, now we've seen them for them now and that's it we've deep dived <laughs> it's me it's trauma <laughs> It comes from a it comes from a lifetime of um, wanting and needing to find quiet spaces. Um, I am I'm an introvert. I extrovert very convincingly. I am an introvert, and I need um, I need a lot of recharge time. I need need a lot of downtime and quiet time. I also get overstimulated very easily, mm -hmm. and so from childhood I am the one looking for where is the quiet pocket at the party where is the less crowded area of the festival where can I where can I go for a walk that I am not seen I'm not so all the time I love I love flying under the radar. I love just kind of slipping through because that's when you see things at their most authentic. You know, mm -hmm. I, I walk prolifically in our neighborhood and um, I tend to not walk the fronts of the buildings. I love walking the alleys because they tend to be more unkempt. Um, you get all kinds of interesting plant life and animal life popping up. Um, but it's also a less, it's a less polished perspective of each of the houses and each of the families and each of the properties. And so you get to see these little intimate glimpses of things that you wouldn't normally either because um, you're looking at kind of that front scripted view of, of the home or of the place. Um, 
or because it's so busy because there's traffic and there's people and there's dogs to navigate and that sort of thing. So yeah, I love, I love dipping into those little quiet pockets, both in terms of the physical realm, but also in terms of kind of the psycho-spiritual realm, you know, dipping into, dipping into the quiet places for a minute and just really limiting, limiting input and seeing what is actually there underneath all of the noise mm. I yeah, I like yeah yeah finding what's underneath i think is is yeah it's a really interesting i think actually we're having those moments to pause and just kind of even if you're not physically pausing but that almost like pressing pause on the brain and all the mental stimulus all the time um mm -hmm. and just having a moment you know um yeah i'm a big fan of sort of getting out and just even like simply like where I am we've got a little bench outside and it's just so nice even though it's not far away at all from you know the entrance it's that thing of just being there and when I'm not <laughs> I always make sure I fed the pigeons first because otherwise there's <laughs> <Yeah. farmers. laughs> and the pigeons will not they have become the mental stimulus <laughs> <Once I've fed> them, <laughs> then it's just a case of like just yeah just being there and just seeing I think yeah Art of noticing. I know Alex Rick talked about this a lot with that kind of awareness that occurs when you get more into witchcraft and and into that kind of seeing, like you say, the kind of unseen and the unheard sometimes. Just yeah, really cool. So yeah. it's sort of well, how did you get into your your practice and and what's kind of changed since you started versus now? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think like most of us, I can look back now and be like, oh, I have always practiced in some way shape or form um so um I'm in the U.S. currently um but my entire family is British and I grew up on uh, flower fairies and the very British kind of fairy tradition and so the idea of magic and fantasy was very real to me as a child and I was forever putting out little tiny meals for the fairies and like looking for sparks of magic in the world and convincing myself that I could talk to chipmunks and you know that kind of thing um and it, you know you grow up and the world tells you that you have to you know stop daydreaming and that sort of thing um but periodically throughout my life I really think if you look at the kind of like my my witchy psycho spiritual journey it's kind of like you know the greatest hits of the era sort of thing <laughs> like you know every 10 years or so like oh we're gonna try this now. oh it's the 90s all right we are blue velvet we are uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're hanging out at the metaphysical shop we're getting our auras read you know that sort of thing and uh you know i dipped into tarot a couple of times over the course of my early adult life and you know it always it felt like it felt like I was touching a live wire mm. and there was always some fizz there was always some sparkle but I think looking back I was chasing after I was chasing after a level of um a level of otherness that was um at odds with who I really am so again we're going to circle back around to trauma awesome. <laughs> it's part of the journey. you know um it was it was about it was about gaining power and gaining attention mm -hmm. early on and I think that's why it didn't really stick because I was chasing after this with the need to to fill a very raw need for myself and mm -hmm. I had not really healed that need so every time I brushed up against magic and witchcraft I knew that there was something there but it absolutely terrified me and so I would do it for a little bit and then I would run away because it was too scary and it wasn't really doing what I needed it to do so um yeah it was i've always felt other and i think you know some of it is being an immigrant some of it is being definitely neurospicy some of it is just seeing the world in a way that is different than the people that i 
grew up surrounded by. Um, and I wanted that, I don't know, I wanted that like extravagantly otherness. It was like so badly to prove that I was special, you know, and I think that's, I think that's a very real thing. I think, especially when we are starting out in craft. And I think, especially if we have any kind of family centered drama, I yeah, think it's a sure. very common and I can look back now and I can forgive myself for really just desperately trying uh, in very messy and very inappropriate ways to fill that need, you know, um, but then I went to therapy. Yeah, <laughs> I feel a lot of those things uh, mundanely. Um, but the glory is I found a therapist who was very willing to engage uh, magical practice in mm. my therapy. She was herself definitely not. That was not her vibe. But she's like, hey, if this is something that works for you, I'm interested in learning. We're going to talk about this because it's a way that you can use to kind of yeah. process your trauma and heal. That's so great because... Um... yeah. Yeah, I'm like, my therapist is the same funny enough. Um, oh, good, good. Yeah, honestly, I was because it's always that thing. It's like, <laughs> fortunately, my 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 therapist is great with um, anything kind of queer or anything like that. Um, yeah. But um, I was like, and it's one of like, you know, queer is fine. Like, okay, you know, and it's like the, <laughs> yeah. witch, the thing you go, oh, I'm gonna put your toe in the water and be like, ah. Oh, so by the way, <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's always that's always a fun conversation. So I'm here I am like literally like butterflying my entire soul to you, but there's this little tiny pocket here that I haven't shared with you. So I'm gonna share it with you now. And somehow like this is the terrifying part. It's not all this other stuff. Yeah. Because like, no, that's what I hired you for. I hired you to look yeah. at all of this gross stuff, but also there's this other thing. And no, Dude. she was delightful. And she's also queer. So uh -huh. yeah, and it was I had not really realized how important that was to me. Mm. I, again, always knew that I was queer somewhere on the spectrum and went through lots of different permutations of what I was going to call myself and how I identified and that sort of thing. And, you know, at this point in my life, I'm just queer. It's, you know, that's what it, it is. It is the catch-all. Um, yes. Yeah. It's catch-all and it's flexible. Because uh, did you know, Lee, that people change? Did you know that? I mean, yes. <laughs> did you know that we're, I know. Did you know that we are not a monolith and yeah. uh, that we can, you know, on any given day, you know, blow in the wind slightly mm -hmm. and that that is normal and that is fine and that it's a functional part of being. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's fine with your practice as well. You know, I think there's a lot of parallels there. And, and just having that kind of letting yourself transform and things like that and letting yourself have those moments of movement and and you know like that you said about that sort of live wire of otherness I think it's it's interesting because after a while when you first kind of engage with that live wire you're just going in and being like what and kind of grabbing hands and just like what it's all very shocking and very like Wah! and it's this whole overwhelming thing but after a while you learn how to ground that energy that kind of thing into something that is really usable to you know enable you to actually use that stuff and rather than being overwhelmed by it or by using it in a way that's kind of quite erratic it's that concentrated kind of power um in a sort of responsible way or a concentrated awareness i suppose um but yeah that's yeah that's an interest i like that sort of concept of flow and I think yeah it's the same thing I think we have to allow ourselves to be experimental and a bit cringe sometimes and it's okay oh, yeah. do you know what I mean absolutely I think the the best things happen when we allow ourselves to be silly and cringy and weird and I don't know this feels really awkward but we're gonna give it a go anyway and I think there's there's a the palpable difference between I'm going to be silly and weird and awkward and like this like viscerally feels like scary and wrong and but I'm going to make myself do it anyway because I think this is what witchiness entails I mean that right there that that's like a thumbnail sketch of like my 90s era you know witching because yeah. you know 
witchy and new age were just so deeply intertwined, at least locally for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of weird, a lot of weird shit. <laughs> and it's like you know and you're young and you want to push boundaries and you want to you want to push up against like okay where really is my comfort zone and is my comfort zone just me being comfortable or is my comfort zone no this is my this is my boundary in terms of like what i am going to hold myself to in terms of my behavior and my relationships and my priorities and my kind of long term goals so mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say then that the biggest thing that's changed in your practice since you started was perhaps yourself rather than any one thing? Oh my goodness. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, I mean, in some ways I think we're all still kind of, you know, that weird little kid, but I think that's the good thing. That's the good part yeah. of it. Cause I think when we were children, you know, our minds are so malleable and so open to just really embracing and enjoying the inherent magic of the universe. And I think, you know, as we get older, we sort of, you know, we tighten up both because of our own kind of idea of, no, I have to be an adult. I have to be a grown up now. And also, you know, external um, encouragement, we'll say. Um, but no, I have, you know, through therapy, through learning how to have healthy relationships, through distancing myself from my family and giving myself some room to breathe and really, you know, process and grieve and, you know, start to envision what is my life now that I have kind of made it through, you know, Madonna's proverbial wilderness, you know, what am I now? And, mm -hmm. um, my magical practice has been just so fundamental in that I really credit that with the effectiveness of processing all of that. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, that makes me think because I, I was, we share a similar experience there because when I hit my 30 or literally hit 30, I was like, right, I've, I've had enough time kind of lost to, you know, shitty family trauma and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, what, you know, if I was to be born today, what would I, what really, or if I was to reset, I suppose, today yeah. as a little adult, <laughs> you know, yeah. entering into the world, how would I, what, what's important to me? Um, and obviously the wife, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I realised that magic was something that, although I'd practised before then, was still, it was still important. It was still kind of integral to my mm -hmm. kind of, understanding and navigating the world um the magic of the world and that's something that yeah I think it's so interesting to sort of go back like to say to that kind of weird kid let's talk about the pigeons and um my dad when we were, he was moving away he said, oh here's some pictures and things like that and, he, and there was a picture of me feeding pigeons <laughs> and I was like of course <laughs> nothing has changed right yeah right and I oh, think there's there's something I think there is something so tender and so so sweet about that. We can show up for ourselves as adults yeah. and, you know, be be who we needed when we were that weird little kid. And yeah. that really, that informs so much of, of both my witchcraft and just kind of how I move through the world at this point is just recognizing, you know, what can I be for the next weird little kid? You know, what can I be for the little weird kid that still lives in me sometimes and still needs a little bit of attention, you know, yeah. and showing up for showing up for regular witchcraft practice is one of the ways that um, I do that for myself, because, you know, growing up in a dysfunctional family, you know, our needs are definitely not in the top 10 <laughs> of things that anybody's really paying attention to <laughs> and you know taking time for ourselves and to do things that mean something only to us I think is intensely powerful and yeah. I think we can struggle with it because it's because it seems silly because it's selfish why are you doing this you're not being productive you know all that mm, all that stuff um 
So I think any time that we carve out, even if it's just, just 30 seconds to get witchy for ourselves, I think that's just tremendous in terms of our healing and our growth, both as witches and as just people. Yeah. 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 That's fun. I think that's, yeah. As, as you know, as someone with myself, you know, having necessary family estrangement there, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we spend so much time guilting ourselves about the decisions we've had to make. Oof, um, yeah. And we kind of forget that actually what we've done is by not having to spend the energy uh on that or have that energy drained by a person a family or whatever it is mm -hmm. um that you end up having this gap and like why not fill it with something that is joyful why not actually think huh that could be something i and the trouble is you know i, I don't know about yourself but i've found that you know when you say about like my needs being pretty down, low down the list what happens is you kind of other people's need become top of your list, you know, your personal list. And you're like, right, I need to sort out this person, that person, that person. Yes. And it's very hard. And I was, I have ended up having a chat with my therapist recently about, you know, just spending some time reading. So on summer break at the moment from uni and I'm obviously still working, but just in the days that I've got time, just having some time to sit on the bench and read something. And that felt really indulgent. And it was, and it's like, this is literally just, sitting and reading a book <laughs> it's like I'm going to eat oysters somewhere <laughs> right yeah and it's amazing mm. how like I always think like the things that we would encourage other people to do if we saw that they were you know kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel a little bit or feeling a little afraid around the edges like we'd be like no you need to take some time off you need to take a personal day you need to just go sit on a bench and read a book you know all of these things that we are actively encouraging other people to do when it comes to doing them ourselves, <laughs> yeah, so like, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> and you know, yeah. I think some of that is that whole like, no, I don't want to be lazy, I don't want to, you know, that sort of thing. But also, kind of circling back to our conversation about quiet spaces and small spaces, if we just sit and we take time for ourselves, we might think about some things. <laughs> yeah, we might yeah, have some awesome. There might be feelings. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, honestly yeah and it's, yeah. Thing is, it's tough isn't it? because there's times when you you know you want to engage with sort of the inner voice and things like that and there's sometimes where you know and you're using this kind of hand movement, I always think it's kind of like the sea of capitalism it's like you must be productive oh. you must do this you must do, and you know it's like mm -hmm. ah so <laughs> that's that kind of thing of like going hang on I, I'm not going to subscribe to the whole kind of productive thing, obviously enough so I can live, but it's right. also then yeah. going, okay, that voice aside, what am I avoiding by not engaging in, you know, what a lot of occultists might call shadow work or not engaging in this kind of like actually digging in and just mm. doing, I mean, I think the thing is we call stuff like this sometimes, you know, therapy or shadow work or whatever, but it's just, it's sometimes the dirty work you've got to wash your clothes at some point and it's kind of like washing your mind you know you've got to kind of get all that dirt out and go okay now I've wrung it out a bit what does it look like you know what how's it yeah. gonna dry out is it you know what do I want to wear this still or do I want to actually maybe go no you know what I'm, I'm done with that bit of clothing or that sort of label or, or whatever it is I think okay. is yeah so how do you yeah. think you you're saying you know showing up for yourself with your practice how do you go about that practice is there like a particular schedule for you or is it more like a yeah yeah sort of um it's you know mo like most neurospicy people consistency is both you know very necessary and also very difficult for me. yes so <laughs> what i have what i've realized is that um my approach is definitely a what is <laughs> this is going to sound terrible what's the least amount of witching that i can do <laughs> You know, which, which is terrible, but it really, it takes the pressure off because yeah. I think, you know, we just came out of summer solstice and like, I know like, that's like, rah, that's like this big event in the witchy year for so many witches. And like, this is the bottom of the cycle of the year for me. This is when I have zero gas in the tank. It is hot. I am miserable. Like there is nothing there. I can't, I can't muster up this massive, you know, cone of witchy energy this time of year. And I used to beat myself up about that because, well, you know, real witches, you know, make bonfires and jump over them and do this whole thing. And that's just not, that's not what I have. And so much of it is 
really been focusing on what part, how, how witching fills my tank versus depletes me and really noticing when I am doing witchy things, is this something that is draining me to do both before and after? Am I like exhausted even thinking about doing this witching thing later on in the week? Or am I like getting fizzy? Am I jazzed up about it? And after the fact, like, do I feel pleasantly wrung out, you know, or do I feel just, uh, just scraped dry and really noticing what, what methods of practice really in, revitalize me because at the end of the day, you know, we are skeptical witches. We know that at the end of the day, the universe doesn't need us to, to function. Like we don't have to get out there and make sure that we call down the moon or else, you know, it's not going to happen. The work, the, yes, the heavens will continue to move without us. We don't have to do these things. We do them because we want to do them because they are meaningful. But if we don't have gas in the tank to do them on a particular day, turns out, you can celebrate solstice two days later. Guess what? Still summer, <laughs> you know? Sure. Yeah. So my yeah. daily stuff is very small. Um, I have an altar in the bedroom. Um, and I always have a, I pull Tara once a week for myself. Generally, every once in a while, I'll pull a little bit more, but I try not to get too granular with it. Cause I think sometimes you know, pulling a card a day, like, man, I need like three days to process the card I just pulled. What are you talking about? Why am I pulling a new card now? No. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have my little altar. I have, uh, I do a 10 card spread once a week where I tend to ask myself sort of, you know, three related questions. Sometimes it's around a theme. Sometimes Sometimes it's literally just, I have nothing. What do you got? And I just lay out my cards and see what we might have. And then there's always a card of the week that I pull. Um, and that stays on my altar. So every evening, go to my altar. I light a candle because turns out I'm a little bit of a fire witch. <laughs> Flame and fire and burning thing. Turns out that is that is what gets me excited. So we light a little candle, take a little minute, and literally sometimes it is I am lighting this candle, I am looking at my altar, I am snuffing the candle, and I'm going to bed. Like sometimes that is all I have. And I have really worked on being okay with that and recognizing the value in that because did I show up? I showed up. I showed up with what I had, which I, what I had was 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, sometimes what I have is half an hour of just absolutely lush pre-bedtime ritual, but you know, that's not very often and that's okay. You know? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And then I, you know, I try and do some of the Sabbaths. I don't do all of them because I, so many reasons. Um, I love me a little love me a little Samhain. That's, you know, that's one of those times where I think that even as, even as a secular witch, I feel like we can kind of pull from the vibe that all of the other witches are kind of throwing up. It's kind of like, you know, when everybody around you is like super amped about Christmas and you're like, yeah. okay, I can get a little Christmassy with that. That's fine. I'll, you know, it's kind of that sort of feel. Like everyone around me is like, ah, seven. And I'm like, okay, that's not that's not my thing. But I can kind of draw from that that collective energy a little bit. Yeah. So we have a little bonfire. We write some stuff on some bay leaves. We burn the bay leaves. I. Basically, I spend the entire day outside next to the bonfire. It's delightful. I love it so that's much. That's a little bit chicken, isn't it? It's, it's that's so yeah. Right? Yeah. And I love it because, like, it's it's slightly public witching because, mm -hmm. you know, our, our back area is actually fairly visible. 
And, you know, that's the one day of the year, like, all right, we're putting on the witchy garb. We're, we're doing it. And yeah, it's, it's nice sometimes to, um, to be a little extra, you know, because I think normally, you know, we're just sort of t-shirt and dungarees, which is, I mean, I don't know about you, <laughs> like, this is, this is it. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think every once in a while, it's nice to, it's nice to judge it up a little bit. It's nice to kind of put on some of those, um, trophy trappings and just go revel in that for a little bit, you know, again, to play and have fun. And yeah, I think that's, uh, that's so true. And it's interesting to say, you know, that, you know, Halloween and, and at Samhain and things like that, but also in, uh, you know, recently this year, going to conferences and it's funny because mm. you'll have these you know very serious people who are very knowledgeable rurals, and they're wearing like the most pagany pagan <laughs> outfit of all time yeah. and you're yeah. like this is epic because you are just being the you know you're just really stretching that boundary and and being like this is the most if I'm gonna witch up I'm gonna witch up big time do you know what I mean and it's that yeah expressionism that I think is you know I think there's a lot of kind of people who will moan about you know aesthetic and all this stuff and it's like why can't we just have a bit of fun with it like you know the fact that I wear cheesy t-shirts with silly quotes from various occult movies is you know it doesn't distract, detract from the fact that you know I, I know some stuff I don't know all the stuff by any stretch but I know some things right so it's that kind of thing of letting ourselves be a bit silly because our knowledge and our anything else like our character will speak for itself and and transgress those kind of those boundaries that society perhaps puts upon us of being like right that must be very uh norm core and and this is this and that and then you're just kind of you know what's the point of being a witch if you can't be a little bit out there and a little bit you know yeah yeah i think that that drive to be taken seriously oh, you know wow. is, is i think that just gets in the way like so much with our ability to just really relax and enjoy our own craft, yeah. um, you know, and I I have feelings about witch talk. I have feelings about you know kind of the aesthetic witchery, but I also understand what it's like to be young and be just really invested in that developing that outward expression of yeah. who we are because it's important that the rest of the world know who we are and you know i think i think my difficulty with it is that that's all we see mm -hmm. all we okay. see is the aesthetic stuff so that's why i was so excited to talk to you because i know that we're you know we have some aesthetic but it's not you know it's not the instagram filter aesthetic and at the end of the day, we're going to talk about kind of the the boring grubbing, you know, grubbing yeah. part. Of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, part of witchcraft. And that's what I, that's what I really wish that we would see more of, yeah. you know, and I understand why we don't, because it's not shiny, it's not pretty, and it doesn't sell stuff, yeah, you know. <laughs> It's so it's such a, a shame, and I know we spoke about this separately recently, about a whole kind of the capitalization of witchcraft when you remove wow. you know being able to sell something uh or being able to you know whether witches have a shop or a book or whatever it might be um you know or a channel or whatever it is if you remove that like what practice do you have left as that individual putting it out there you know what is it that you've still got is it actually a practice for you or is it a practice for you know other people or is it performative it's difficult to know sometimes when you're looking at you know I mean I don't know about you but like I have these paradigms to spells and I'm like it works that's fine and it's very boring and part of me wants to post what I do on a daily basis which is yeah. very boring yeah. <laughs> but it's just do you know what I mean it's one of those things it's just yeah whenever I see a really shiny post and stuff I'm thinking of times where you know I've been squatting down to take a picture of some, you know, bird's foot tree fall or some kind of weird little plant that I've just gone, oh my God, and I'm just there like a, a giant frog. Absolutely. <laughs> People are looking like, what on earth is going on? Yep. 
what's happening and you know the strange looks people get when you're like touching a tree and you're just like oh, it's my favorite tree and <laughs> like i'm gonna say hello um but yeah and just stuff like you know with the you know my offerings did my witch did is going to be messy it's going to be dusty it's going to have ash on it from incense i probably should have you know put more carefully and other stuff i mean it's got wax hanging over it's yeah i think it's this weird thing of we don't have to do everything beautifully do you know what i mean yeah because who is who is saying what is beautiful and what isn't and part of the reason i like witchcraft is because you know sometimes it is ugly and it's gnarly and it's or it's ugly by other standards you know i think it's um yeah, it's fun to sort of play in the dirt and slip on your bum and and you know and you're trying to <laughs> explore somewhere you probably yeah. shouldn't explore, but there was a nice mushroom that you want to take a picture of. Do you know what I mean, it's that kind of thing of yeah. like just being all that. And you know, it's that. Yeah, I was talking uh, or I put a post up, uh, the controversial post about sitting on the loo. Um, oh my and, and Having oh. having this kind of thoughts about and I was literally sitting there and I was like right so it's like this kind of bound thing and then you've got this and this and this and I'm there and I'm like oh, I'm literally sitting here and I'm just I'm on the toilet and like this is ridiculous I'm having these like celestial thoughts and I'm sitting there like, oh, what else are you gonna have though a thing of like that is that I'm not walking around a, a park looking like a fairy or oh, you know yeah. whatever it is I'm I'm sitting there on the loo going like huh I should probably write this in my notes because this is mm -hmm. <laughs> on my, yeah. my bloody phone it's yeah yeah I don't know if you find sort of any of those what has been your kind of messiest witchcraft that you've you've done it or messiest part of your kind of witchcraft do you think uh I mean all of it's all of it's pretty messy I don't do a lot of it <laughs> I don't do a lot of aesthetic stuff. Um, my my go to like kind of spell work is I call them magpie spells because I will get an idea in my head like okay I need some help with this um, or like I need to like kind of nudge things in a different direction or something like that and so I take either a little silver bowl that I have or a cup. And I just go walk around the house and I walk around the garden. And it is literally like, that tickles my brain. That's going in the jar. Ooh, I know that's good for this. That's going in the pot. You know, it's very, and like, literally I end up with like, I have a vessel full of these things and maybe I'll put it outside. Maybe I'll put it inside. It's, yeah, it's nothing. In terms of like spectacular effect messiness, uh, I don't do big spells, but I have to tell you my favorite, um, my favorite realization that maybe I need to watch what I do a little bit. <laughs> a couple summers ago here in Southern Pennsylvania, our summers tend to be sopping wet until they aren't and then very dry. And um, thank you, global warming, the very dry part has become very dry for much longer and um we had reached a point where we'd been in drought all the reservoirs were low like it was getting it was getting fairly dire and there was a storm system kind of creeping in and I'm like, right we're gonna do some elemental witching we're gonna go out there we're gonna water spell it's great we're gonna like help just encourage the rain that is already coming just to be like hey yes we want more of this and I put my little spell together. And at the very end of it, I'm like, I'm going to spit on this. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, my water being sacrificed to this, to, you know, I'm giving you something. So you give us something. I like big spit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. All right. Lee, we had so much race. <laughs> <laughs> just absolute just sideways just solid sheets of water coming out of the sky all of the windows leaked the parking lots like flooded like like it was a whole thing and like okay i know i know scientifically that i had nothing to do with this but also maybe next time 
a little less with the hawk too, as it were. <laughs> oh, it was, oh my golly. That was, that was, and you know, I love, I think this is my favorite part about being a skeptical witch is because scientifically and realistically, I know it had absolutely nothing to do with that, but it's letting that little tiny part of your brain in the back corner be like, okay, but what if? Yeah. This is what if. Let's just say, just for fun, that we had a little something to do with that. Isn't that neat? Or in this case, wasn't that dumb? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. Yeah, no, and that bit is really underrated. I think body, bodily fluids in general, you know, obviously there's various narratives around it and, you know, oh, sure. that. But I do think that, you know, and it's, it's things as simple as witch bottles, you know, traditional witch uh-huh. bottles would have contained piss and things like that. And it's yep. like... Now we're kind of like, oh, it's going to contain some nice glitter. But other than that, I'm not sure. If, and it's like, oh, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, sometimes you've got to pee in the jar and that's so okay. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you do. And I think, you know, it's very easy to like really just kind of swing in the other direction. Be like, I have to bleed for everything. I got to pee on everything. Everything has got to have a piece of my hair, you know, that sort of thing. And that's, I feel like, you know, putting a an actual physical piece of your body or fluid from your body into a spell i feel like that's the kind of thing you save for special occasions you save for when like you really need to fucking send this (laughs) like you know kind of the no i really fucking mean it spells you know because i think you know again kind of circling back to like the ugly era of the 90s there was a lot of blood play and I think it just really it really became a it became a shock value it became a very performative you know thing yeah that live wire thing again and also maybe you know not the safest thing to be doing yeah. at that point in history like I don't know why we thought that that was remotely a good idea but you know but yeah, I think, you know, allowing ourselves to be a little grubby, to be a little weird, to be a little, you know, strange and come out of our witchcraft, you know, a little dirty, maybe not smelling great. Um, definitely not with any flattering pictures whatsoever. I think is really important because it's not about, it's not about what it looks like to anyone, including ourselves, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, we can talk about, you know, sort of uh, body image and um, and aging in witchcraft, mm-hmm. because I think, you know, the thing that I struggle with very much as, you know, I am 51 years old, I am not a skinny girl. It's so hard for me to find people who look like me who are witching and who are witching visibly. I know that there are a bajillion witches that look like me out there, but I think it's where we discourage ourselves from, you know, making making that visible. And I think we do a disservice to ourselves because we kind of have this idea that no, no one wants to see this shit, whatever. (laughs) But also I think particularly for younger witches, I think seeing what witchcraft aging in place looks like, you know, is really important. And I think yeah. it's important to show how our how our craft changes over time. Yeah. And um, that it's okay to change as a witch. Mm-hmm. That, you know, when you're a little slip of a thing and you're like, no, oh, I'm a, you know, kitchen witch and this is my vibe. And after a couple of years, you're like, I am really sick and tired of carving sigils into the top of my bread loaves. I would really like to do something else. You know, that that's fine. That's okay. And you don't have to be any one thing. Like just because you have, you know, just because I have put this tag of hedge witch on myself doesn't mean that I don't flirt with all kinds of other kinds of witch. It's all fucking witchcraft. It's, you know... I know everybody loves a good quiz. Everybody loves to like pick themselves out of a lineup and be like, oh no, that's totally my vibe. 
but I think it's so important for us to remember that, you know, we are ever changing, ever evolving, which is, and, you know, it's okay for our practices to change. It's okay for our ideas to change. It's okay for us to not believe things anymore that we used to believe in. And it's okay for us to believe in things that before we may have been like, ah, that's, you know, I'm not going to, you know, that's not worth my time. Yeah, that's you know? so interesting. I think, yeah, I mean, it's coming up this November, it will be seven years. Um, that I you know, know that I definitely was self identifying as a witch. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously before then, animism has kind of been a bit of a thread through my life, but definitely with being able to say, right, and I'm quite specific about that because I think people over, they over lean on or kind of over rely on, I think, that kind of concept of years of practice because mm, yeah. somebody, you could learn a great deal in one part, say, you know, kitchen which and like you say and then that doesn't necessarily mean you know anything about grimoire magic or about you know the particular paths it, it's things like that, that I think sometimes when we label ourselves too soon and there is this desire as you say we end up kind of a, a sort of blinkered a little bit and we end up missing a lot of per peripheral information that's actually so helpful um, because we go, oh, it hasn't got this label on it. I'm only going to read books that say Green Witch, oh, yeah. um, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and I think it's a shame really because having that period of time, as short a time really as, as seven years is, mm -hmm. it's that thing of so much has changed or developed and kind of fallen away and manoeuvred. And, yeah, the biggest thing I've learned is to cast your net wide you know as wide as kind of is respectful um and yeah and just sort of being like, okay what works for me what actually contributes something to this rather than takes away like you say about the energy thing I think oftentimes we can be a bit we're trying to do witchcraft rather than um be within it yeah yeah, yeah I think yes I I think that's very accurate I think it is it's seen as, I think sometimes we can get into kind of list making as witches, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, I've got this date coming up, the full moon's coming up. We, I want to do this spell. I want to do that spell. And at the end of the day, it just sort of ends up as another entry in the bullet journal. And in some ways, I love that. I love that. Just, yeah, it's just fucking normal life. It's what I'm doing. But I think it can also very quickly turn into that sort of, I'm doing this by rote because I feel like I have to. And I think that's that's when you suck the joy out of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's when you put those unnecessary undue pressures on yourself to kind of perform up to a certain standard. Mm -hmm. You know, either one that you've decided for yourself or one that you see other which is particularly, you know, I'm thinking specifically of like content creator witches. And you're like, well, they've got time to do all of these elaborate moon rituals. And, you know, they had three days to plan their freaking in bulk celebration. And, you know, they started planning for this months ago. What's wrong with me? And, you know, I think sometimes we can take a little inspiration, be like, you know, maybe I could work that into my practice. I could be a little bit better about that. Wouldn't that be neat? But I think it's very easy to just kind of slide down that slope of, oh, I am a trash witch because I can't even remember to, you know, visit my altar every day, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I feel that. It's not with summer solstice, but, you know, you talk about solstices and things like that and, and you know, making time and planning for celebrations and things. Like and with the solstice, it was just one of those things that I'd had some recent time off and I you know didn't really want to take any more time off and so then it would require that for me to really spend some proper time on it um so yeah work fortunately was very flexible and let me move my break and I had 15 minutes you know to yeah. to do a little solstice ritual yeah. um and that was it and that was and that was fine though and that was okay because I I, I checked out the sun as it you know set amongst all the 
<laughs> the very urban, very, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. you know, and and that's not you know, it's not um it's not like I was in a lovely forest or, you know, mm -hmm. at the sea looking at the sun kind of coming down and being very excited. You know, I did my various gestures that are part of my routine and I and <laughs> yeah, it was what it was. It was but it was but it was yeah, it was something that I could say, like you say, I've shown up, I've done the thing, um, you know, I've done the magical thing, which is the whole point really of of yeah. my perspective here and, and I think you know something you share as well is that kind of desire to kind of get you know get nitty gritty and get on with it and do it how you can because sometimes you just don't have yeah the time and I think we like you say who is setting those expectations is it something we're reaching to that is achievable or not and it's like that whole nonsense around the whole well we've all got the same 24 hours and it's like oh uh, Mm. It drives me. I got feelings about that. Yeah, it drives me. <laughs> me too, not. Just, yeah, absolutely bonkers. And I think that's the same with with witchcraft and and things like that. And I, yeah. How do you think? So, how do you think? Sort of, you maintain that kind of magical process then when it gets that tough and it feels like you know, haven't got the time and everything like that. And especially over the years when perhaps that novelty has, it, you know, there's not much novel necessarily oh, what do you think is your kind of um is your go-to to sort of help yourself through that and for, and for other witches as well who've been practicing a while what would you sort of advise i think um i think really finding the magic in the mundane is it for me um part of my magical practice i'm, I'm really i'm a big fan of magical practices that do not look anything like a magical practice but really fill that sort of magic bucket. Um, every morning, I have a very specific trajectory that I take around the house to open up the shades, pet the cat, feed the fish, that sort of thing. And from the outside, it just looks like maybe I'm a little, little persnickety about the way that I like things, but okay, whatever. But it's very much a um, kind of, opening the house and kind of setting the day for me so I think taking things that you can look at and be like I am already doing this thing how can I make this a little fizzy how can I make this a little bit more magical and sometimes it isn't changing anything functionally about what you are doing it is how you are doing it so as you are going through and opening the blind and kind of opening the day, as you are going through petting the cat and connecting with this animal that lives in our house. <laughs> like, what is this? We've invited an animal to live in our house and, and we feed it and it sits here and it allows us to interact with it. It's wild to me sometimes, you know? And just little things like that. Um, and then I go outside and I have a very set circuit that I do to go around the garden in the back mm -hmm. and I check in and say hello and good morning to all of my plants because thank you for being here, you know, and I think just we were talking about earlier about just that taking a moment to notice things and kind of expanding your awareness of your surroundings. I think that is at the heart of what can keep us practicing when we don't have time to practice. Even if we aren't physically changing anything that we are doing, just allowing ourselves that mental room, even if it's just for 30 seconds, to remind ourselves that there is something, there's something more to all of this than just all of this you know Ooh. all right dropping the wisdom i love it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i yeah, mean you know yeah. there are other things other things that i like to do if i am feeling particularly fried you know we talked about fire you know mm -hmm. just simply lighting a match for me just that that microsecond of concentration that you need to get the match to light that to me, that's a lovely 
little like micro break, mm, okay. you know, because for just that hot second, literal hot second, nothing else matters. You are striking that match. And, you know, sometimes when I really am at the absolute end of everything, I will light a match and I will blow it out. And that's just, it's, it's finding those little teeny tiny, I, I think of them as like little feeder sparks. Mm-hmm. Just like a little, just a little something just to pepper into your day to remind yourself that you have this. And it's okay if you don't have the time and the energy to construct elaborate altars and you don't have the wherewithal, you know, financially or otherwise to construct these brilliant things. You know, go pick some sticks up, go get some leaves, go, you know, walk out. I found a beautiful feather gift mm-hmm. from one of our local hawks the other day. I'm like, there it is. This is coming home with me because it was like, you know, those times in the video game where it's like, oh, this is obviously a thing I have to pick up because it is so conspicuously placed. It was one of those. I'm like, all right, that's, you know, we don't have to we have to invest in our witchcraft, but it not in the way that I think sometimes we think we need to, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's the personal investment. It's not the financial investment. And honestly, and I know this is a hot take, it's not always the time investment either mm-hmm. because we don't all have the same 24 hours. We don't all have three hours before we get started work in the morning to faff about the house and look at gardens and, you know, read texts. I mean, I do, but that's because I have the luxury of doing that because I am self-employed because everybody else leaves the house because I have a house for everybody to leave, you know? And I think I think we can get ourselves into this trap that, oh my gosh, I don't have time. Therefore, you know, it's taken me six months to read this book. Therefore, I'm terrible at this. No, you, the book is there. The book's not going anywhere. The book is not there hurrying you. If you can only read for five minutes at a time, go read for five minutes. That's five minutes more than you had. Yeah. No, yeah. every little bit helps. So I yeah. think if we can really, if we can distill down what our craft really means to ourselves and what our priorities really are in terms of the non-tangible, non, I I feel like this is slightly sacrilegious, not doing magical things, you know, (laughs) but we're going to, we're going to, but, but we're going to be the magical thing. Yes. Yes. You know, I think one of my favorite, um, witchy podcasts out there is, uh, Molly Dyer's witchcraft off the beaten path. She was on hiatus. She is back now. We are being very gentle with her because <laughs> stuff. <laughs> she's back. We're very excited. But one of my favorite things about the way that she talks about her practice is really leaning into this idea that we don't need anything to do witchcraft. We don't need tools. We don't need crystals. We don't need incense. We don't need any of that shit. We just need to exist as witches, thus and therefore, the witchcraft is happening. Mm. And I think when we are scraping the bottom of the barrel and we are feeling really like butter over too much bread, I think that's, I think that's so important for us to internalize that simply existing and moving through the world as witches is our witchcraft, you know, and I think it's very like I can already hear the little voice like, well, if you're not doing anything, then aren't you? Re- you're not really a real witch, rah, rah. you know. And I think it's it's very easy for us to be like, oh, well, that's easy to say. You just slap on a pentagram necklace and you walk through the world and you tell everybody you're a witch. Okay, so what? So what if people do that? That's fine. People can call themselves witches who don't witchcraft. Whatever. That doesn't take anything away from us. And I think if we can, if we can carry, carry our witchness with us into the world, that is the foundation of our witchcraft. 
Nice, yeah. <laughs> oh, just yeah, all of that is just great. I think it's so, and it's so timely as well because, um, yeah, to your point about getting out and about and sort of digging into being kind of present in whatever you're doing and, and going out and sort of engaging with the world. I think that's that's so key because I think the trouble we have with modern occultism, you know, one of the many sort of challenges rather than trouble perhaps to word it more neutrally is that we seek online communication as our first port of call because that's what we do now. It's just, you know, that's how we go about it. You know, before it would have been there's an ad in the newspaper or there's a, you know, a little in the classifiers or something like that. You know, who does that anymore? So we go online, but then it kind of feels like sometimes we can get stuck in that online thing of always observing and not actually observing the virtual rather than observing the the present, you know, the reality of our yeah. of our space and seeing what's going on. And you know, and there's so many things that you can do in the space of your yourself, your home, your local little area, you know. I set a challenge for myself to try and learn the plants that grow by the side of the road on my way to yeah. my local shop, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's it's like a 10-minute walk, but it's, it's I found a fascinating plant. I found this thing called Lady's Thumb, right? And Ooh. I was like, okay, right, what's okay, this? Okay, you know? tell me more about this. It. Is, honestly, <laughs> it's, and it's the most brilliant plant. I, I feel like I want to try and cultivate it if I can and like, get it to grow in other spots because it's native here and it's a wonderful plant that's got this kind of um this sort of almost jagged I suppose uh or a longer oval you would expect but in the middle of it generally the leaf has a red mark a kind of blotch and the story goes that this lady had bumped off her husband and and ran off um but she'd she'd left blood spatters on her way and they found her by the blood spatters on these leaves and so it's called oh. Lady's Thumb yeah because it's sort of like a thumb kind of length um and these little blood spatters and to me that's so it, I would never have known about that plant if I hadn't got my eyes looking at the ground and going huh what is that what does that do other than look great and exist and it's a thing I love that in itself do you know what I mean but what is that something that I can you know play with with you know the magical sort of thing and, and what could that be and I think you know if we go by the folklore of it it would be a great one for you know detection or uncovering things you know things like that it could even be something for like escape or you could you you know you could maybe hide the evidence as such with that leaf yeah. if you wanted to do some sort of invisibility work as well or all things on those lines, you know what I mean? Obstrication. And so just with one little walk to the shop, looking down, it's sort of, it's a task I'm doing anyway, you know, I need to get some bread or I need to get some eggs or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, and I look down, I go, what is that? That's really cool. And then you find out that stuff and you're like, what the flip? And you know, with the with the solstice, when I nipped out and looked over at the sunset, it was the sun, a sunset that was only happening that time, that once, that moment. And it's that thing of whenever I feel stagnant in my practice or I feel a bit weary in my practice, you know, going and seeing the bees messing about with the comfrey and, and being like, oh, blimey, you know, it's this, this, yeah. this great big comfrey plant, this bees, like, oh, God, <laughs> I can't get in here and just do its thing. Um, but, yeah, and then going absolutely wild and just... Yeah, all that stuff. You notice these little things, um, and the interactions with, with you know, the pigeons. The pigeons have a certain hierarchy, and there's it's more pronounced with jackdaws. And the only reason I know that is because when I take out the rubbish, sometimes I notice, you know, how people are, or how they're feeding this, that, and the other, and who gets to stand where, and who stands on the higher thing, the lower thing, and the, who pecks at who and all this stuff. And like sometimes I have time to sit out there and look at them or maybe I'm hanging up the clothes and stuff like that, you know, on the washing line. It's all these little things of like, just, yeah, just getting those little moments. And I think the more we spend off line, uh, the, and, and, you know, the thing is that is a kind of almost um, dangerous thing in a way now, but in terms of the kind of how we, uh, or rather, not dangerous, perhaps um, a kind of unusual thing to to be doing because we're so 
online we're so right we need to engage with this person that person the other person i need to post this post that i need to take a picture of that i need to you know i mean look at a certain angle and it's like but what you're not capturing there is that uniqueness necessarily of that moment like you might get a little sliver of it but i don't know about you but a lot of the memories i have you know the most magical kind of memories that i have are moments that no one necessarily has shared or there's no record of it's just that little moment in time do you have a moment that's like sticks out in your mind it's like being particularly a really magical moment for you or um, several? i can think of several from from my childhood where you know we had we had a little farm um that we moved to shortly after we moved to the states and you know it was the 70s so i was absolutely feral child um chucked out the back door in the morning told go go be outside go do something don't come back until the light you know at the at the summer house comes on that sort of thing um so i just i remember going down past all of the like the the barn and the chicken house and that sort of thing. There's a big long slope down to a little stream. And on the other side of the stream was really just undeveloped land. It was woodlands for the most part. And um like six acres of it. It was a ludicrous amount of property to do absolutely nothing with. It was fantastic because I would be out in those woods all day. Just mucking about in the dirt picking up acorns lining them up to see you know which one's bigger which one's smaller you know and I have vivid memories of just that hyper focus that you have as a child of you are just you are in the thing that you are doing and then all of a sudden looking up and it's dark <laughs> and just realizing that Every, like the entire universe has just vanished in this just little spheres of focus that I've been maintaining. And now I am sort of coming out of it and the fireflies are coming out of the leaf litter and just, it's moments like that when you have, when I've just been so lost in, in a thought or in a moment. And it seems silly that I'm all like, no, we have to notice absolutely everything. That the most magical part for me is when I haven't noticed anything. <laughs> oh, but, you know, there a couple of years ago, I took our very young son up to um, this place called High Point here in Pennsylvania. And it is, strangely enough, the highest point. <laughs> um and uh, we had gone up there because uh, the person meteor showers were coming through. And I'm like, hey, buddy, let's, you know, let's drive up, you know, at dusk and we'll go up to High Point. And, you know, we took blankets and we laid down and that sort of thing. We're laying down, we're watching for stars. And it wasn't, we didn't have a great show. It wasn't a great night for it. So, and after a while, you know, get a little chilly and we sit up and unbeknownst to us, the fog from the river had come up and so you know when you're sitting down and you're looking at the sky you can see the sky perfectly but as soon as you shift that vision to go horizontally through the atmosphere the fog was a wall it was just our little pocket that we were standing in and then just sheets and sheets of fog and you know, no one else is up on this hill in the middle of the night. This is not what normal people do in this area. So it was just us and it was so quiet. And, you know, there's that immediate kind of like, ah, shit, we fucked up. <laughs> like, <I know. laughs> and, you know, I think my son was maybe like seven. So I'm like, okay, we got to keep it cool, Ma. We got to, we got to keep it. No, 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 this is fun this is magical this is exciting no come on this is great and it was fine because you know it was a gravel track to get us back so as long as you could hear your feet on the gravel track you were fine no big deal and that that walk which 
deliciously is a spiral around this cone-shaped hill through the mist, through the fog, and every once in a while, like a bird would just explode out of the grass in front of us. And you can hear like the crickets and the frogs and everything, but, and just the crunch, crunch, crunch of our feet on the gravel. And that memory sticks with me for just so many different reasons. But just in that moment, recognizing that this entire world is just getting on with its shit, doing its thing, absolutely regardless of any intentions that we had, any priorities that we had, any concerns that we had, the world's just going to do its thing. And we have to navigate through it in a way that is largely on trust. We had to trust that the path would take us, even though we couldn't see more than two feet in front of us. And that if we just sort of relaxed into that moment, it was magical. It was like nothing else we'd ever experienced. But I think, I think sometimes, like if I would have tried to take a picture of that, <laughs> there would have been nothing to see. If I would have tried to record that in any way, it would you would not have been able to capture anything about that moment. So for me, the magic moments are those that you know that absolutely nothing that I do is going to preserve this moment other than my memory of it. So I am just going to just let it all soak in <laughs> i am just gonna be a satellite dish and <laughs> i'm just gonna let it all in here and know that this is the only this is the only witness to this moment mm -hmm. and yeah mm -hmm. that's yeah mm -hmm. i love that uh. Yeah, it's just, yeah, and it's just the specialness of that sort of thing, isn't it, you know? It really is, and it's, yeah, it's just, a, and I think the thing is, there's a difference between, I think it's a feeling that you really kind of, it gets in you, do you know what I mean? It's it's that deepness and, and, and that sort of profundity that occurs, uh, and I think that's, yeah, that's what makes them so memorable, but that's also what makes them so hard to, to capture at the, at the same time, you know, that kind yeah. of complexity. And it's 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 infuriating, isn't it? I think <laughs> it reminds me of <laughs> trying to take pictures of the moon and things like that. And like the moon is just like, no, I'm never gonna yeah, behave like, quite no, how you want me to. No, or like the in the spring when all the little tender baby leaves are out and the sun is coming through that. You can't you cannot photograph that color. You cannot do it. It just you just have to be there and witness it and just carry it with you in here because you can't, you can't grab it. And I mean, I think that's, that's high magic right there. You know, yeah, I think that is, yeah, mm -hmm. that elusive kind of no one else will see this. No one else will know that this happened, mm -hmm. but I get to, and that's pretty fucking magical. Yeah. yeah, I love that. There's a cherry tree, a wild cherry that is a, is a street tree. And, you know, again, this is to the point of kind of noticing and, and paying attention. And it, it's my little marker of spring, generally, because yeah. it goes into, first of all, the little buds come onto it and you're like, oh, buds, you know, and then they suddenly just pop out. Like they'll do a little thing and they're like, kind of out here. And then suddenly it's just out. And sometimes yeah. you don't even have to look up to know that they're out because you... It, it's on the way, funny enough, to the local shop, and um, and you can hear it. You can hear the bees and the insects oh. because it just gets so full uh, yeah. to the point where you think, "Is there a hive? Like, what's going on?" It's <laughs> just it's just so abundantly full, and the bees are just like, "Yeah," and they go, right. <laughs> and it's and they don't care. They're just doing their own thing, and they're you know, and I just love it. And sometimes I will just stand under it. And just absorb that sound and that literal vibration of the, you know, them buzzing about. It's that yeah. kind of, yeah, it's a wild feeling of, 
and, and yeah, and how can you how can you try and translate that technologically? I think we we're getting better with the tools that we have to try and communicate with one another and communicate certain things. But I don't know if we can ever really get that. Yeah, that's the and also the fact that feeling is can be completely different of the same event, the same the oh, yeah. same plant to other people and it, it's quite fascinating to see those different you know different perceptions and different things that people have or take from experiences mm -hmm. yeah that's what I think that's what I like about writing so much and why I have just throughout my life I keep coming back to it um is I feel like of all the ways that we have to capture moments and feelings like that I feel like writing is the best way to do it because it doesn't actually physically capture anything it is all it's all just processed through us and i think i don't know i am just in awe sometimes of how how the written word can communicate things that are in so many ways uncommunicable if that makes any sense you know, yeah. as the other, and that's why I like doing the the soap work that I do as well. Is that I feel like scent is one of those mm -hmm. like high magic things where yes. like you can say so much by how like making a smell. You can just transport people because you know it tickles all those like non non wordy parts of your brain. And just digs right into those emotion centers and, you know, ah, it's ruthlessly efficient. I love it so much. <laughs> it's evocative, isn't it? It's so wild. Yeah. There's a particular smell of wood smoke and it has to be a particular smell. Oh, yeah. I, I know you will know this from dealing with so many scents, but mm -hmm. there's a particular smell that brings me back to a memory that's a very early memory of when I was four, maybe, I don't know. But my, it might have even been before then to be fair, because my, I just know I, I get this like flash of being by this big bonfire, bonfire again, um, and my dad like taking me to this thing. It was, I think it was, it was near a nearby field. I grew up in the countryside, so it wasn't you know it could have been any field, but right. it was just that sense of the heat and the, oh, yeah. and, the, and, the and the you know being told you know be careful don't stand too close but allowing you know that exploration at the same time um and just that particular scent it just flashes that memory every now and then someone will be burning something and if it's the right almost like I want to say tome but if it's yeah. the right kind of thing it's mm -hmm. it's just it's so weird how evocative that is and how much it you know it's particular incenses that just make me go oh that's the re high street or do you know what I mean it's yeah. like different things that occur um you know an old wood I grew up in a in an old building uh for the first part of my life and um that particular smell of like old old wood is 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 wild it is yeah, but yeah it's all very yeah it's it's fascinating to sort of have those different experiences and those particular yeah, I don't know what it is about scent, but it's it's beguiling, I think. Well, what do you sort yeah. of, is that the kind of main enjoyment of scent, or is there perhaps more kind of alchemical part that you enjoy? Or um, for me, it is it's very much about um when I'm developing scents, I'm usually yeah. I have something specific in mind. I'm thinking of a place or a time or a moment. Um, every once in a while I will do like, I want to do something that smells like a thing, you know, but it's usually a thing in a particular time or place. Um, I'm not who you come to if you're like, I went to smell like lavender. I mean, I have lavender scented stuff, but it's, you know, it's like, no, but it smells like what the moon would smell like if the moon was made of lavender. Like it's that kind of thing. So, um, no, I'm, I think for me, I was, um, I dropped out of college, but when I was there, I was a psychology major. Big surprise there. <laughs> Everyone is shocked. Um, so I am always, I'm always interested in um, kind of that, that Jungian concept of the collective subconscious yeah, and yeah. what I can use in terms of specific notes and specific like textures of smells 
to evoke emotions and memories and sensations in people. Um, it's fascinating because scent is so subjective. So what is, you know, a very sweet, soft, nostalgic smell for me can be a very, you know, harsh, traumatizing smell for somebody else. So I'm always aware kind of, of, of the power that I yield, it, which sounds terrible, but um, I'm always aware of the fact that this can be a really emotional thing for people. And it sounds stupid to be like crying over a bar of soap, but it happens because, you know, because I don't know what your history is with a smell. All I can do is sort of build my picture of using scent and hope that something in that picture triggers something for you, be it good, bad, or otherwise. And, you know, that's, I don't do a lot of in-person vending anymore for a multitude of reasons. Um, but that was one of my favorite things about just being in person with people as they're smelling my work is watching kind of that kaleidoscope of experience. And I mean, honestly, that is also magic. That is, that is a spell that I have made to evoke a thing and let's see if it works, you know, and it's okay if it doesn't, it's fine. If people are like, no, I get something completely different from it. It's just, it's that, that playing with those, those kind of societal constants of different scents and the associations that we tend to have with you know, what does cinnamon evoke for you? You know, what does leather evoke for you? That sort of thing. And then like smashing them all together and seeing like how complex of a picture can I build? And will it still like, will it still like have an effect? Will it still, you know, get you where my head is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a lot. The cinnamon thing gets me. It's cinnamon every time it gets me because oh, yeah. there was... <laughs> Was, there was a drink that we uh, used to sell at a, a job I used to work at and it had all sorts of spices in it and um a, a new worker took so, like tried a sample of them and they they couldn't say anything other than it's like Christmas in my mouth yes yep <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was like this is the perfect explanation of this yep. thing like, yeah it's just so perfect I was like this is I can't like if I want to, yeah, I had no words other than like, yeah, it is because it's yeah. just, yeah, fantastic. I think yeah, scent, taste, those are those kind of amazing things, and yeah, that's kind of like your, yeah, your sort of magical, like you say, magical power of transformation of, of yeah. you know, evocative. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, would you, would you say that you would say scent is a kind of, I think tool is probably a, a limiting word here but you know speaking to kind of tangible things that you might use in your practice is sent one of those things that you consider a tool in your practice are there any oh, other tools 100%. that you regularly you know oh in, absolutely in... yeah i mean you know I, i'm a witch so you know i love burning shit and smelling it um, <laughs> you know, it's yeah uh we love we love a good we love a good charcoal tablet with with things on it for sure um other things that i uh what do i use um other than like you know kind of your bog standard like i'm a witch thus and therefore there is incense there are tarot cards you know trap candles all the all the traditional trappings honestly a lot of a lot of what i use is either sound or the lack thereof mm -hmm. okay. yeah um i like i don't think that your mic is picking it up right now but in the background on my end i have a uh I have a soundscape playing of just birds in a woodland forest mm -hmm. because that is what makes my, that noise, that sound, that makes my brain sparkle. Mm -hmm. And so I am, 
I'm using that that soundscape to activate kind of the witchy part of me a little bit, if that makes any sense. Because I feel at my witchiest when I am outside, when I'm listening to birds, when I can kind of hear the, I call them outdoor rooms. I don't know if this is a thing, but like when you're sitting somewhere and you can sort of see kind of an outdoor space sort of framed by either trees or buildings or whatever, like in my brain, that's like, that's a nice room kind of. Ooh, yeah, yeah, I don't know, like, I don't know where yeah, that comes from. I think, it's, I think it's one of those like super, super like old, like um, like garden and landscape design kind of concepts. Huh. Anyway, um, so yeah, I use, I use sound a lot. I have a, um, a noise generator. I'll share the link with you because I want everybody to use this noise generator. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and he has just a huge array of different soundscapes and textures and that sort of thing. So if I need to, if I want to meditate and kind of really give myself something to focus on, silence is never good because the anxiety will pick up every little click and creak of the house. And like my brain is like a rabbit, it will be off. <laughs> So I need some kind of sound to kind of wash out all of those extraneous noises so that I can really kind of lift my brain out of my skull a little bit. Um, but on the contrary, I use silence an awful lot in that I don't speak things aloud very often. Um, I don't, I don't use music very much in my practice um, mm -hmm. in terms of kind of a conscious, there's definitely, I think a lot to be said about uh, the power of, you know, a particular like, you know, mixed CD and a good road trip. Like that's, that is also, that's, that's magical space. And I don't care who disagrees with me on that. Um, but I don't use a lot of, I don't use a lot of music to get me into witchy space. Um, and I think, I don't know if that's unusual or not. It feels, it feels yeah, like it might not be something. And, you know, I think some of it is just kind of that, that, you know, little bit of auditory processing kind of, I get overwhelmed by noises very easily. Yes. So, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think, yeah. For me, music, I find it distracting in, in terms of when I'm trying to enter into a ritual process and mm -hmm. um, because I, have a particular phrase or a particular sort of set of words that I will say in before and after and all this. There's a certain rhythm to it that I want to be able to hear fully and I want to be able to express fully. Yeah. Um, and that whole thing about, you know, words having power and all that kind of thing. And just, yeah, just engaging with that and making sure that that's kind of heard. And it's a bit like, you know, it's like when you're with spells and things like that as well. It's that kind of thing of having the clarity there is helpful for me. Do you know what I mean? It, because if I'm, if someone was speaking over music, I might be going, what did you say? Do yeah. you know what's going on there? Whereas if oh. someone's saying, can you do I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. And that's kind of the same thing I want to, you know, put out there to whatever the creative force might be uh, that I'm engaging with. It's that kind of same thing. I want it to be as easy as possible and as accessible. I think that's the thing. It's about accessibility as well as possible for myself but also for the creative force for that sort of sense of of al alchemy do you know what I mean I think that occurs yeah. that kind of transformative thing so yeah I don't know I think a lot of people have like witchy players and I've got one that I really love but it's more about the energy raising you know or just like you're saying road trip cleaning the house that kind yeah. of thing it's yeah. that sort of vibe um or you know, very quietly on in the background if you've got friends around or something like that. It's not necessarily something I would use in ritual process as yeah. such. Just because, like, it's one of the few times I actually like a bit of... <laughs> Normally, <laughs> <laughs> like, I have, like you say, something on, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of ambient thing or unless I'm kind of hyper-focused on something, I've completely forgotten that the world exists for a minute. Oh, yeah. You know, like, so. uh -huh. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. So sound and silence. Sound I like that. Silence, um, yeah. Yeah. And honestly, you know, falling back to Molly, Molly Dyer again, me, just myself, my body, my hands, my, you know, just the, um, I use the warmth of my body 
a lot. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm doing like, I don't do, I don't do crystal work. That is not my vibe, but I have a couple of rocks that I really, really like. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes just like kind of carrying them like against my skin to warm them up as kind of part of an activation kind of thing. I like that a lot or like cupping things in my hands, cupping herbs or plant material in my hands and kind of warming them a little mm -hmm. bit before kind of releasing them into the spell. You know, I like, I like that a lot. Um, yeah. yeah. Hands, are hands, hands are one of those things that's sort of the first things that I found useful as uh, a magical kind of tool as such or a magical kind of device. Um, and it, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, like being a skeptical kind of witch and things like that, sometimes difficult, but I think whether it's by all those old books used to read of like, you know, focus on what you're putting into the spell, blah, 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 blah and all this stuff. But my hands get kind of hot when I'm like, right, it's time oh, to yeah. do the spell work. It's yeah, time yeah. to do a ritual. The hands are getting hot and it's like... I know that logically this is probably just the brain being like, right, these are going to get used right now and there's going to be focus here and I'm just focusing on something I don't necessarily normally focus on. But at the same time, it's that sense of a significant feeling of change that is interesting. And, and yeah, and it, it is that thing of, of, yeah, of just that, that again, that sort of uncapturable sensation of this is something that is happening that I'm experiencing in the world um yeah but yeah hands are definitely one of my favorite i do a lot of thing. yeah i do a lot of like kind of friction kind yes, of yeah, yeah. yeah um i i love i love a good clap yes, yes. <laughs> love That's us a good great. clap either either to kind of like start things off like all right here we go or i love it as kind of like an ending and banishing kind yes. of like, you know, kind of sign. The uh, another thing that I was thinking about in terms of sound, um, I call them clatter jars. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that is um, just like, you know, big old mason jar with a metal lid. And then uh, I'll put like pea gravel and rock salt in it. And then, um, depending on what I'm trying to do with that sound, I'll put kind of corresponding herbs and that sort of thing in it. And I shake the shit out of it yes. and it makes an unholy noise. And <laughs> I, I love, I love sound cleansing that way. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, I ended up with a lot of my mother's belongings in the house for a time um and she and I I've got no contact with her now it's almost a year now and it was a long and arduous process to get her shit out of my house <laughs> because you know as long as her stuff's still here she can kind of you know still pull me back in and we finally we we had a plan we got all of the stuff out of the house it was moved and I did a very thorough sound cleansing with a very large, very loud clatter jar shaken into and at all of the places where her things were in the house. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of around the house in general. And just as a child who was not allowed to make noise, <laughs> make it some noise be loud causing a racket uh was super super powerful and i love i just love that i love causing a fucking ruckus to to clear a space which is you know entertaining since so much of my work is in silence and no sound or minimal sound you know sometimes you gotta sometimes you gotta make some noise yes. to really either push out energy or to bring in and raise energy and yeah so yeah oh, I love big fan big fan oh, honestly it's so it's so funny because like you say the clapping thing i absolutely love 
clapping at the end of a ritual because it is that sort of like shockwave effect I feel yeah. of like right now it's like let's get out there, there's things done and like whoa do you know what I mean um and yeah you know the beginning I kind of I like that sort of feeling of like right on on we go but I definitely use it more towards the end but it's so funny you say about the uh the cl- uh, um jar and and I love the idea of putting herbs in with that because I use some um uh, snail shells I've collected because oh. I was trying to sort of be very um I don't know I had this sort of hyper fixation on finding natural uh materials or local yeah. materials and I was like any bells I've got I don't really know where the metal's from I don't know yeah. who made it like it's one of those things I'm just like mm. and so I was like right I'm going to find um you know some something more tan I thought well snail shells if they clatter together they're yeah. quite loud like you know fairly and it's it's yeah. a sort of odd sound but it, in in its oddity that works um so yeah so a strong sound together and uh and just shaking those little fuckers yeah. <laughs> it's so great it's so oh, great I love and that so, I love that do you know what I mean just that whole kind of sound cleansing is something that I think is completely under underestimated because you just having to do the movement in itself is kind of energy raising in you yeah um, yeah and it is that sort of disruption that is actually really lush to do. And what, what happens now is I'll say to the wife, right, put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> and then <laughs> yep. go for it round the round the flat. And it's just so it's so great. And it feels, yeah, it feels really cathartic to do. Um, and it literally is putting this kind of vibration out there. We know through the sound waves. So mm-hmm. it's, you know. It's a whole load of different things. But, yeah, the herb thing, I think, is really cool because there's no reason why I couldn't necessarily, because it's the outside of the snail shells that uh, clatter together, why I couldn't put something potentially inside them and seal them with a bit of wax or something. Yeah, mm. and it was, that would change the tone. And yeah, I use, yeah, I use uh, snail shells and ammonite a lot in mm. uh, my healing from generational trauma work. That's interesting. Okay. How does that work? That, um, the concept of kind of the, the chambered Nautilus. Mm-hmm. So you've got you've got kind of the way the the Nautilus shell is is grown, it grows in this spiral ever widening, but there are chambers within it. It's not just an open tube all the way through. We grow a little bit and then there's a little cap of shell and then we grow a little bit and there's a little cap of shell um and if you have a uh, fossilized nautilus the an ammonite that's been split through the middle you can see what is collected in each of those chambers and you can sort of see kind of the the geological history of place where this uh, nautilus shell was over time as each of those bits of kinds of earth get encapsulated and I just love that. I love that sort of spiraling out of kind of the past feel when it comes to kind of generational trauma work and appreciating that, you know, all this dirt that we carry around with us from the past, it's still there, but it's encapsulated you know, it's not, it's not muddying up what comes next. Because in some chambers of the Nautilus, it is a clear distinction. This is some kind of silty sandstone. And this is, you know, much more glittery kind of quartz based particulate for whatever reason. And the sparkly quartz isn't dulled by this silt at all. They coexist, but they're one isn't getting in the way of the other anymore and I just I love I love snails I love kind of that idea you know being an introvert of being able to like oh I can just like completely pull myself back in and I don't have to deal with anybody that's delightful um but I also love it as kind of that spiraling out of a dark and constricted time Mm -hmm. and kind of growing new chambers for ourselves yeah. You know, with our new environs and our new energy and our new power and so oh, that's powerful yeah that's really great 
Oh, yeah, that's yeah, I love that. That uh, that spiral effect is really clever, actually. And, and I think it works so well with concepts of time. Do you know what I mean? Uh, time is, isn't necessarily always a linear thing. Sometimes it feels <laughs> quite cyclical at times. And, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that idea of, of kind of widening out, it makes me think of kind of history in a way. Um, with my sort of history hat on here of just like these moments of encapsulated, you know, periods of time, but this kind of hopefully, in my optimistic sense, this expanding oh, of always. understanding yeah. of each other, you know, and 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 engaging with each other in a, in a meaningful and respectful way and and that whole thing. But yeah, I love that, that kind of, yeah, that in, encapsulating and the separation thing. I think that's really important for folks who've had, you know, generational trauma and and you know issues around that uh, i think you know and especially it speaks to a really great way of doing kind of some sort of ancestral uh, work without um i think it's interesting to sort of say you know you can do ancestral work without giving ancestral access in some respects do you know what i mean <laughs> some of that sort of yeah. place yeah there. i think for it, the, yeah for those of us who don't um who don't have great connections with our ancestors. I mean, my entire family is in the UK and, you know, I've seen them a handful of times if at best. They're not relationships that uh, we've been able to cultivate particularly well. And they're not people that I understand deeply. So sometimes doing ancestor work, it is, it is like flapping in the breeze because, you know, who knows who these people were, you know? So I think, so much of it is kind of digging back through that nautilus a little bit to find those kind of those older rings those older chambers within ourselves and kind of figuring out like okay it wasn't necessarily an ancestor ancestor it's ancestral me if that makes any sense yeah like i can't dig back you know five generations into my family and have any idea beyond very rudimentary facts, you know, who people were, what their priorities were, what they were about. I can make certain kind of socioeconomic and cultural and historical assumptions mm -hmm. about that. Like, well, you know, they were Northern England. We know what was going on at that time. Chances are these things were on their mind. Chances are they were probably roughly this sort of people. But other than that, who the fuck knows? Yeah, no, that's the thing. Isn't it? It's so it's so intangible sometimes. But I think what's been helpful for myself is knowing that just as you know, folks like us and have this kind of a label as this sort of black sheep kind of of the family sort of thing, there would have been other black sheep. <laughs> you know, there would yeah. have been other outliers and other folks who didn't necessarily, you know, retain that kind of. I think the thing is, you know, when we think of a family tree, we forget about the parts of the tree that might have fell off or jumped like off yeah. onto pastures new. <laughs> and like, we're allowed and, to atrophy or yeah, we're and yeah. just like, you know what? I'm gonna, yeah. And I think in a way it's that, like you say about the untouched kind of quartzy bits. I think it, you know, sometimes ancestral uh veneration or ancestral work is having to, you know, go, no, not that chamber of the Nautilus this one you know or even just the idea of this one and so it's that kind of thing of like what i call the sort of rebel rams you know <laughs> being a aries you know who were those rebel rams in my ancestral line who didn't necessarily fit within the narrative that was you know that is so tangent because you know there's we have progress and we have change because not everybody thinks the same way and so and we know that happens you know, there's literally historical fact of people having progressive ideas, otherwise there would be no progression. And so, right. you know, I think and there's also that expansion of the term sort of ancestor to be a kind of, um, what do they call it, like an ancestor of alignment in a way, rather than necessarily, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that's interesting to say. And, you know, cultural kind of ancestors, you know, whether that's queer cultural, someone's own particular, you know, the experience or, or heritage and stuff like that I think there's interesting things that occur that we can and people that occur that we can engage with 
it in a way, you know. And that happens with occultism itself, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, but also lessons from things like animals, plants, stuff like that, you know, that kind of that interchange and the realising that humans aren't the pinnacle and the only thing. And, you know, it's that, it's that meme that goes around of like, oh, please, ancestors, help me. And it's like this fish, like, flopping about, <laughs> like, flopping noises. And then someone recently <laughs> added on to it, actually, I'd quite like to hear what they have to say. Like, right? do they, <laughs> sure they have something to contribute? <laughs> you know, like, well, <laughs> maybe they've got some great advice. And I think we often, we kind of deify nature without actually really engaging with it you know because there are things that are like you know tough and and challenging with nature it's not all sweet and twee and all this stuff when you kind of dig into it you know there are things that sting and things that don't things that are sort of a bit gnarly you know there's lots of lessons to be had there There are things that are profoundly unfair and unkind Mm. in Mm. nature and yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right that the whole kind of nature veneration thing, you know, I think it's a very slippery slope to kind of idealized, you know, ideas of, you know, how nature operates and nature can be pretty ruthless, you know, but I think we can, we can pull from that because sometimes, sometimes being ruthless, sometimes being, um, sometimes cutting off things that are not serving us um and kicking things out of the nest that really should have left a long time ago or shouldn't have been there in the first place you know Mm -hmm. i think i think that can be really powerful for us as kind of nature oriented witches of one kind or another you know is to you know and looking at things like just the simple fact of like you know flowers bloom they create seeds there's a bajillion seeds not all of those seeds are going to make it through the winter without being eaten let alone germinate let alone turn into plants and i think that's a that could be a powerful thing for us as witches that not every witchy idea not every witchy pursuit not every like oh witchy notion that we get is gonna make it through and germinate and actually come forth and that's okay it doesn't like every single thing that we do doesn't have to be you know a home run it doesn't have to be like if i'm gonna do this i gotta see it all the way through sometimes we get halfway through a spell and we're like i am not feeling this this is like wow i thought this is really what i wanted to do and i am this is just feeling like busy work now and I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I think we can, we can learn from kind of the ugly, the, the, what we feel are the more unpleasant realities of nature a lot. I want to talk for a hot minute. You were talking about um, family trees. Are you familiar with the concept botanically of the sport? The sport. Yes. Oh, (laughs) so a sport is when you have a plant that is doing its planty thing the way it is you have you know an apple tree that is growing red apples as a red apple tree is supposed to do and then you have a yellow apple that just kind of fucking shows up on the red apple tree for no good reason and I, I love that concept for those of us who are kind of cycle breakers and black sheep and whatnot. Like we are on the tree. The tree has mm-hmm. produced us. We look nothing like the rest of the apples on the tree, but we're still very much part of this tree. Thank you very much. And mm-hmm. the sports are what we use to create new varieties of apples new kinds of plants new colors of geraniums whatever much better than the broken off branch thing that is my yeah i mean let's be fair i mean sometimes sometimes the branches are broken off sometimes you know the tree does atrophy a branch or you know on on purpose but i feel like i feel like the sport 
theory for us, I think can be so much more empowering because it doesn't imply that there is something inherently wrong. Yeah. We're just different and we are appropriately jarring <laughs> to the rest of the tree. I mean, because I, you know, it's really, because at the end of the day, I think when, when you have, when you have scapegoated children, when you have black sheep of the family, the, the reason that we are problematic is because we make other people uncomfortable. Mm. And we, um, we question things that are unquestionable mm. in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And that's not wrong. It's just very conspicuous in what would be otherwise a pretty much, you know, everybody's sort of bought into the system, you know, kind of situation. So yeah, go be a fucking sport, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, oh. Quick, no, because it, also, if you are that sort of random fruit, <laughs> as I quite literally am, but... <laughs> I understood that reference. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of lovely because yeah I, I love the idea of like just at some point when you're ready hopping off the tree and and rolling off and growing your own you yeah know, yeah know, that's yeah and the growth that can happen from that sometimes it needs to be further away from the tree sometimes it can be nearer but right mm -hmm. it's you know it's one of those things oh yeah oh that's lovely I love that oh good I'm so glad I'm so glad that's really oh, lovely funny. Love it. Mm. Yeah. Are there speaking of uh, trees and, and plants and things? Are there any particular ones that you tend to use in your practice or work with in your practice than others, or not really? Because you say you go out in the garden and you know oh, yeah. check in yeah. plants and things. I am a prolific gardener. Um, I do a lot with native plants. Hmm. Um, I really am committed to the idea of um, planting and nurturing, and growing plants that are specific and indigenous to our area. I have some, I have some fun stuff. I grow tomatoes, you know, I grow the edibles, you know, that sort of thing. But in terms of kind of the more permanent and perennial things, I really try and grow native as much as possible. Um, partly because I'm lazy. And did you know that native, native plants will grow much more happily with much less care <laughs> where they're supposed to be? um and also from kind of a pollinator and habitat standpoint yeah. you know native plants are much better for our native insect and bird and animal populations and that sort of thing so um i love grasses i'm a mm -hmm. grass person apparently i did not know this about myself until i started planting them um i love the i love the texture I love the way that especially like large clumping grasses change so completely over the course of the year and yet so subtly because I mean at the end of the day a clump of grass is a clump of grass it's always going to look like grass but it changes texture it makes a different noise it'll put these funky little seed heads out and then the birds are all over it if you dig down in the middle of it then you find like all the snails and all the weird little things um I love uh, like braiding things with like big long pieces. I have a couple of native grasses here that will grow like five and six feet tall. So, you know, using, you know, blades of that grass, either fresh or dried for like binding spells or tying things or making like little reeds or like wrapping little bundles. Love that. Big fan. Uh, my other favorite thing are berry canes. Um, I have uh, raspberries and blackberries that I'm cultivating on the back edge. And I love those because uh, they're, they're, very, they're very England for me. That was very much like I am planting these as like an ancestral kind of, you know, thing here. Um, so I love all the different, I love that you can get so many different parts off of a berry cane you know unlike the grass which is it's linear it's kind of yeah. its thing 
Barry's like, well, do you want a leaf? Do you want a cane? Do you want a flower? Do you want a berry? I mean, we've got everything for you. What do you want today? You know? And um, so, yeah, I work with, I work with berry canes and the leaf and the berry and the flower um, a lot in my work. And, um, and then my girl loves a bay leaf. Oh, I God. love bay leaves so much because they are so accessible. Mm -hmm. I understand, you know, the privilege that I have of having a home that we own with, you know, a large garden that I have the time and the space and the money and the energy to be able to cultivate and grow things in. Um, I love bay leaves because you can get them dirt cheap for a big bag and use them for all kinds of things. Um, I like writing stuff on them and burning them. That's, I like doing that either to release a spell or to kind of dismiss and be like, I'm writing this down because I don't need this anymore and I'm going to burn it and we're not carrying that anymore. I also love them. I call them heart shields. Um, mm -hmm. When I was going through a very difficult time with my family, where actually like being, like having to go and see them was just, oh, it was it was incredibly draining and just really, um, it just flattened me every time. So I started wearing a literal shield inside my bra of a bay leaf dressed with a couple of different oils. Mm. And I would put that in my bra over my heart before I would go and see my parents. We'd get through it. And then when I got home, I would take that bay leaf out and either burn it or throw it off of the back of our property so that all the stuff that that bay leaf absorbed while I was there, I was not continuing to carry with me. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah really love that. Yeah, that's lovely. That whole, yeah, that shields a lot of things, mate. That's yeah that's really good really nice and i like it because you know it's just it's really small it's really mundane it's not like this whole thing i mean you know i did stuff with my athame and i did stuff with my wand and that sort of thing but like in the moment like five minutes ago i didn't know i had to go over there i have to go over there and deal with whatever new chaos they have wrought um i gotta shield up Whew, let's go you know yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that that's so good yeah and I think it just speaks to the fact that you can use you know you can use anything for that it doesn't have to be a great big crystal you know that no. you're dangling mm -hmm. here there and everywhere and stuff like that you know it's going to be just something very nearby very local very your own you know and also something that is you know biodegradable really which is lush. right yes yeah. yeah yeah I really I mean I'm kind of a nerd that I don't like using I don't like like buying stuff for my practice <laughs> unless it's from like little indie witchy stores um i like using found items a lot either found outside or found in the junk drawer um i have to tell you that the bolt spell that you did oh. that changed my world as a witch <laughs> like what do you mean you can just get a bolt and you can do a drawing spell? What? What is this? And it just, I have to thank you so much for that. You know, little things like that, using just the most mundane of items and just being able to see them in a completely new and magical way has just, it has transformed my practice so much. So I thank you for that. Oh, thank you for that, mate. I appreciate that. <laughs> Seriously, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. lovely feedback, and um, yeah, it's just lovely. I, I, I'm always sort of in shock when people say, you know, they've taken on board something that I've put out there because I sort of half the time I sort of think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful for anybody who like watches it. <laughs> yeah, I do, and so it's so nice when people are like taking action on this or I'm going to use this yeah. or whatever um yeah it's it's really weird and lovely at the same time so yeah yeah I like that a lot and I think that's the thing that I really want is that is to sort of try and 
offer something. I think, and I think that's the thing as well, you know, talking about sort of why the great ability and the kind of exchange that we have with things. It's that thing with that like community of, you know, when I first started the channel, it was like, what am I actually giving or bringing yeah. rather than what am I taking away from this? Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's something sort of to like ask ourselves really. And I think, yeah, as much as I, and you know, I've been now messing about in academia, it's that thing of like, I understand the sort of labor that gaining knowledge and, and portraying knowledge requires, but at the same time, you know, giving that knowledge out there or getting that knowledge out there is something that is so, it's so, for me, it's very important because I want everybody to have that that chance to be able to do what they can with the information that they've got. And maybe, you know, like you say about having, you know, privileges of, of things like home ownership or a garden or whatever else. You know, if I've got the access to certain things or I've thought, oh, maybe this is going to be helpful. It's so lovely to hear when that thing is helpful because it's like, that's the whole, you know, that's my whole world. I want to try and, <laughs> yeah, just do the magical fun and all that cheesy goodness. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I I really appreciate that you do such intense academic work, which mm -hmm. is, I, that is not my wheelhouse at all. If I read a thing, it is, whew, it is gone. There is very little retention. I don't, yeah. Um, so I always appreciate that you take the time and the effort, not only to read and research all of this wonderful um just, just the history and the analysis of witchcraft, um, but then that you synthesize it in a way that those of us who are not in academia can really, can really benefit from it, you know. And I mean, you know, sometimes my brain's like, okay, this is this is big academia speak. What, what are we doing? Um, but if I just let myself slow down a little bit you are just an incredible font of of knowledge and experience in terms of the research end of things and your book recommendations are always on point and <laughs> i just you know i i appreciate that you are out there doing kind of the dusty work of being a history witch <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah, so man. that those of us who for for whom that is not either something that comes naturally to us or that we have the time or the resources even uh to do i really appreciate that you take the time to kind of parse that out and i hate to use the term digestible chunks but you know what i mean oh, I you know it. Yeah, it's like you you give us you give us those lovely little you know petite bites of things that then encourage us to go and explore and you know learn more ourselves. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Oh, thanks. Man. Yeah, no, that's really that's yeah, that's really lush. I think you know the I'm glad that's the way it comes across because you know when I was first getting into you know when I went. I was thinking about going back to uni I was like oh god how am I going to understand any of it and how am I going to you know read any of it and all that stuff because with the ADHD I struggle with, with long periods of time reading and and, uh, and all that stuff unless I'm really interested in something and, and sometimes that's still not enough for my yeah. brain to go I'm going to pay attention to this but <laughs> you know with and then fun enough with like the language sort of things you know talking with the wife because wife has been through academia and uh you know doing their PhD and things like that there's a particular language that is is kind of necessary to convey certain ideas yeah. in certain circumstances. But I think what happens is we forget that that language, you know, people don't necessarily have the time to know what an epistemology is or whatever is. You know what I mean, to say, you know, an ontology and all this kind of stuff, it's like people are more than people have grasping it. But sometimes I just need to remember that people maybe not have encountered this word before or this concept before, or they've encountered it under a different name or whatever it is. And it frustrates me sometimes when there's that separation between academic thought and, um, you know, and it becomes a bit like high magic, low magic. And it's like, it's just, oh, it shouldn't be like that. It should be go as far as you can with as much as you want to go yeah. in terms of developing your practice, in terms of learning and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely a goal to sort of make things accessible. And I think I love that when I see, you know, people like, um, for instance, Dave Rankin putting out the Grimoire Encyclopedia um, because it's something that lists all of them. It gives suggestive reading around it. It gives, you know, and it's making things accessible to people because it's so, with witchcraft being such a varied thing, with occultism being such a varied thing, you know, whilst core tenants might have very interesting crossovers with one another, the minutiae of it is so overwhelming. And so I think sometimes just taking those key little things and being like, right, here's the thing. What can you actually do with it? You know, it's yeah. fine to go, oh, this is a, um, this is a theory from 1863 or 16. And they're like, okay, that's great. But what can I do with this? Like sometimes I love just learning stuff and I love knowing it. But the the part of me that needs something to chew on also needs something to just do with that thing. Yeah. There. So yeah, no, thank you, mate. I think that's something I definitely want to see more of in the community is more openness to share things um you know at the same time as you know respecting people's need for income and stuff like that but i think it i just yeah i would like to see more community work um than than what's already going on you know i think there are plenty of things going on that are accessible but i just always cringe a bit when i see you know courses for 200 quid or something or whatever it is and you're just like Shoo-hoo. and especially without a payment plan i think the thing is if it's if you if you, that's what you want to charge that's fine but if you're not giving people the option of a payment plan who is able to do that the same kind yeah. of group of people who are going to then perpetuate certain ideas around privilege and access and all that kind of stuff it's sort of like hmm so that's just my little bugbear but yeah do you have any sort of bugbears within the occult community or things things you'd like to see more of or things you'd like to see less of in the community um, we can we can talk a little bit more about the whole you know us payment coaching thing. The whole the explosion of um, life coach and life coach, spiritual coach adjacent stuff um, is a huge thing for me, um, particularly coming from a psychology and therapy background. Um, I think it's one thing, like if you were to do an academic course on like, Hey, here's a history of witchcraft here is, you know, we're going to do some deep dives into some, uh, you know, some base literature and some, you know, original texts, that sort of thing. Yes. Fine. Sign me up. I will give you all my money. Um, but I think when we get into this like mushy, squishy, uh, parasocial sort of Mm -hmm. thing, um, where we are paying for, or being asked to pay for, um, what amounts to friendship. Not a big fan of that. Um, when we are being asked to pay for, um, access to a personality as opposed to, um, access to a trained professional i think sometimes because i there's been a lot of discussion um about kind of life coaches sort of masquerading as therapists and what it is about people who you know why are people throwing money at um at coaches and the like who have no actual training when for the same amount of money they could actually go and see like a real licensed therapist and I think there's a risk of that um, within the witchcraft uh, community as well um, of being encouraged to throw money at people who are witches, absolutely, um, but who are offering who are offering relationships for hire. And I know that that's I know that that's a whole can of worms, and it's very much uh, very much me thing, very much my problem. <laughs> but um, if you want to, I don't know. From my perspective, if you want to witch harder and you want some guidance in doing that, there are plenty of ways to do that that don't involve, you know, two thousand dollar courses, and you know, essentially what amount to sort of group led Zoom sessions 
-hmm. and really kind of watered down and milk toast content. Um, you know, and I, I understand where this comes from because I think at the end of the day, people just want to be told what to do in order to get to where they want to be. You know, if you can give us a, a list, like a task list of things to do, and at the end of the task list, you will feel like a, you know, an empowered witch, you know, there's some temptation to that, sure, because it feels like there's a path. And, you know, having a clear path, I think, is very tempting. Um, but I think when we get into kind of these parasocial relationships with other witches, where we are um, giving them giving them a lot of money uh, for what amounts to just community and friendship. Um, I think that can be, I think that can be really dangerous. You know, I think if you are, I think if you are supplying education, I think that is one thing, but I think it's when we get into kind of, uh, watered down therapy with some just very, very basic witchy skills and then there's a big price tag on it i think it's i think it's really problematic i don't have a good situation my cat agrees by the way my cat has come screaming <laughs> hello <laughs> cat is like yes i agree with you. Like, yes preach it queen <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah i think i think that's you know, that's one of my, that's one of my big bugs. And it's not just with witchcraft community, no, no, it's with kind of the greater, um, greater self-help, whatever. Um, yeah. I would like to see us, as we said, you know, focus a little less on the aesthetics of things. Um, if I never see another witchy haul video, I think I'm going to be happy. Not a fan of that. <laughs> That's I remember that the next time oh, I think of doing oh, well. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, no, to be fair, like, I think yeah. I do think with witchy hall and stuff like that, sometimes if you're showing a place off that that is quite fun. Yeah. yeah. Or showing or separately like repping for um you know small biz or whatever, that's great. Um yeah. or these are, these are the six see, books that I'm going to read this summer. Yeah, like yeah. that's the thing. Like that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Is I'd rather see stuff about, you know, what books you're reading or why, you know, why did you get those books? Why do you, why did those sort of stand out to you? And you know, why these particular items? Because, yeah, that's the sort of thing that I like. Sometimes I, I can deal with it. Sometimes I'm like, this is just the same kind of variation in these in the witchy hall videos of the same sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, and again, it's stuff. It's rather than going, this book is, I'm going to use this in this particular way in my practice, and mm -hmm. you know, la 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 la, or I'm hoping to get this from this, and then maybe, hopefully, doing a review. I think we're very good at buying books, and this is a call out to myself as much as anyone else, <laughs> and then putting them on the shelf, <laughs> and then not actually engaging with them after that initial spark of like, this is going to change my life. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's that kind of thing. And I think that's also the thing with. You know, like you say about paid for community in a way, is that it is that kind of thing of I don't know, just that yeah, it's kind of sad in a way that we have this sort of concept of having to pay for um something that really just just speaks to the disconnect that we have within things and i think the thing is with witchcraft and which with figures in witchcraft you know like from a video about grand toad and other false idols you know people are not witchcraft people are not the only thing you know they're not the only i don't know expert in this or an expert in that or whatever there are so many other people because otherwise everybody <laughs> going to this one person right. and it would just be so overwhelming for them but also so limited in its in their in their breadth of knowledge and their breadth and their and their diversity of experience. So I think what we need to remember is that what is relevant to this person, what this person might be putting out there, 
isn't the fix all for your practice doing the practice and engaging with the world via your worldview however you develop that you know and also you know whose worldview is it that you have is it actually filtered through yourself or is it from this external thing and and you know especially vulnerable of folks like you know like ourselves who haven't had those so many of those roles which have been traditionally filled by you know a parent or whatever or a caregiver or something like that you know sometimes you can end up seeking that in other people and i think there's a especially with the untrained side of things there's a real danger in in that and and then it becomes this kind of unhealthy uh dynamic which you know is easy to get caught in and i think recognizing the thing of like am i putting too much on this what where is my autonomy in this relationship is it with me or is it too far on the scale of you know someone else being the locus of your of your being which i think is yeah yeah but yeah books are definitely one of those things that i think are so i do like to see those do you, do you have any particular that you like really dig it you you know works that you have been really important or works that you're hoping will become yeah. important yeah yeah um the one that i always talk up um is uh kelly and maddox's rebel witch yes. uh, especially for kind of the fledgling practitioner um it was nice as a more established witch for me to read it just to remind myself of what it's like to be so new to this um but i and i mean she and i definitely are not on the same path in terms of skepticism versus theism versus you know whatever um but i just i enjoy the energy that she brings to um what has historically been maybe a bit of a precious uh approach to writing about witchcraft yes. there is an irreverence there and an embracing of kind of modern life modern culture um modern archetypes mm. um that i think regardless of where you fall on the theist non-theist scale i think there's a lot there's a lot there and it's just it's a fun read it's a quick read it's very easy to just kind of nibble away at in bits and pieces it's not this big mm. kind of overwhelming tome but it's also very meaty in terms of here are things that you can do to actually put the things in practice that we've just talked about. So I really, I really like that one. Um, I have to thank you for uh, Deborah Lips bending the binary. Really liked that one. Um, again, very Wicca heavy, not my vibe, but just the exploration of getting away from um, these hard definitions of gender as they present themselves in our craft I think was I was heading down that path anyway and it was really nice to have it articulated uh, by someone who writes about it far better than I ever could so that was that was a great read um I am a sucker for plant guides <laughs> especially old like digging yeah. through like used bookstores and like finding like the 60s and 70s era just like guide to plants. Um, there's so much more in, I think some of those uh, kind of old fashioned uh, plant guides about uh, more kind of indigenous and older cultural uses and perceptions of plants that I really enjoy digging through. And also just being able to identify plants on the street, I think is, delightful um because it helps you it helps you understand the relationship between plants and it helps you understand if you if you need this plant for a spell but you don't have this plant what else can you use so if you need something you know if you want a blackberry leaf but you don't have blackberry leaf what else could you use anything else from the rose family will probably cover you. What's in the Rose family? Let's go explore that. You know, things like that. I I really love uh, just digging into um, how plants are related to each other and what yeah. we can kind of 
tease out in terms of magical uses from yeah from it's that. a lovely old book but um i've got somewhere I, I do want to show it for up on the channel at some point because it's from who knows i think it's the 60s i'm pretty sure it's the 60s and it's it's written in the most whimsical way and it just yeah it's it's great and it <laughs> It's the, one of those things that I think there's a certain lack of whimsy in most modern plant books. There's kind of this, there's a little bit of a lack of engagement really with folklore other than like a small footnote maybe or something like that or a tiny passage or whatever. Um, or it's the completely ones. the other direction. It's super whimsical and very pretty to look at, but not a whole lot in terms of, yes. okay, but like, Give me a family. Give me a genus. Like, where are we going with this? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I agree. Yeah, 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 and you have that kind of divide. And so I think it's what well, the best sort of modern books I see um, have that combination, that nice combination. And I think it kind of speaks back to Culpepper, really. Uh, good old Nick Culpepper, yeah. <laughs> with his complete herbal, because he had that sort of mischievous humor throughout, but mm -hmm. whilst telling us, you know really what it's what its governance was what it you know when it where it grew how it grew blah, 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 all this sort of little bits and bobs um mm -hmm. and what to do with it and whilst that's out you know out of date by a large margin on, on a lot of it some of yeah. it still retains itself uh and, and a fair amount to be fair but i think yeah i think modern especially like plant guides and things like that you know i've, I've been told how to plant something in 10 million books but tell me what about this plant you know really get sure you know that sort of thing it's that kind of like tell me what is it about this as well as things like you know the genes the whatever you know tick those things off for me um but yeah there is a sort of and i think that's a shame because it sort of it reflects that lack of time that we perhaps have more so where there's less time to really kind of engage with the with the subject like we're just like right i need to know this is this, this and this we get on with it right than, yeah yeah, and I think that's when we tend to fall prey to kind of like, you know, the encyclopedias of magic and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while those are delightful as reference points, I think sometimes it's just, it's so easy to be like, right, I need a money herb, look up money in the index. Uh, there's a list. I've got access to these two. Off we go. And, you know, sometimes that's what you need because your ass is broke and we got to make some money. So You're let's so go. <laughs> But I think I think when you can I think when you can take some time and really get to understand plants' relationships to each other and um, understand why like why is basil a money herb? Let's think mm -hmm. about this because it's big and it's flat and it's green and it looks like a piece of money. You know, it's when. But then you can kind of start thinking, well, okay, what else could fill in with this? Is there something that works better? You know, um, one of my favorite things to do is to do dig through uh, tarot decks and do botanical identification in tarot decks. Mm -hmm. Because half the time, tarot artists, were they were just drawing a blobby flower. They didn't really have anything intended. But turns out the blobby flower that they drew actually bears a striking resemblance to the rue flower. So what can we learn about rue that might add another layer of interpretation to this tarot card that wasn't there before? And I think yeah. that's that's why I love that's why I love plant identification is because it can add an extra layer of meaning, an extra flavor to an existing either you know illustration tarot deck whatever you know um, I just love it yeah I love that I always know and I think you know it's the same sort of thing you said whether a deck or something has been made intentionally or not when you or any kind of cover if plants are actual like oh that's a bramble that's a you know honeysuckle yeah. that's a something else or whether it's just like Meh, here's a kind of aesthetic thing that is just going to go on here and and sometimes yeah. the worst I, it frustrates me because <laughs> there are some books that are fantastically full of great information but their covers are so appalling oh, that yeah. you kind of have to always put that little caveat when you recommend yeah. it like, the cover's shit yes. <laughs> but read the content that's the good stuff right? that's where it's at oh, 
you know, but yeah, as a former bookseller, I feel this pain very much because oh. I assure you, this is a good book. Please just don't just, we're going to, we're not going to face this one. You're just gonna... <laughs> oh, honestly, what a mission. Yeah, no, it's just, yeah, it's wild. I really hope sort of things kind of progress it towards something that's a little bit less pink and glittery and, and stuff like that. and that's just my own sort of preference but yeah. I just think there's a certain amount of infantilization or tweeness that occurs that oh this is a the, you know and especially gendering it kind of feels like oh this is a girl subject yeah. that teenage yeah. girls are into and we don't take them seriously so let's just give them you know these generic things so we can just go oh here's your little interest rather than be like this is a subject that could be with you for a lifetime you know right. give you some good juicy shit not to say, as I say, with everything I say, it's always this caveat. Look, if it works for you, that's great. But mm-hmm. I would, yeah, it's just well, and I mean, we can we can dig into kind of like what is it about pink and sparkly that triggers us as yeah, as I mean, for me, like, yeah, non non binary folks of a certain age. Why is that a problem for us? Honestly. And I I've, I've had to think about that a lot, you know, in my sort of knee jerk reactions to kind of you know, Insta witch, TikTok witch, whatever is you know why why is this such a problem for me because i was never pink and sparkly mm-hmm. and i tried to be pink and sparkly and boy hey that didn't fly very well i just you know it just it felt like i was wearing someone else's clothes so you know and just yeah i think it's very easy for us to you know kind of dismiss the the pink glitter end of witchcraft um as as silly and infantilizing and that sort of thing um just like i think it's very easy for us to dismiss kind of the gen z and younger you know getting into witchcraft through witch talk you know through instagram and that sort of thing and i always have to remind myself that we were also young and we were also chasing shiny sparkly things no and that it's okay if that is the gateway yes yeah if if that's what gets them there that's what that's what gets you there that's fine oh and you know if you're 15 years into your practice and you still go with the pink parts sparkly shit that's fine it's all it's all good and you know i i think a lot about kind of the archetype of the the real witch a lot and um as someone who increasingly identifies as non-binary the the feminization of that and the how difficult it is for me as a person who does not have a body that fits you know a lot of this witchy clothing has no interest in buying any of this witchy clothing per se certainly doesn't want to hand wash all this witchy clothing (laughs) ain't nobody got time for that Mm -hmm. and you know i think it's you know we're circling back again to just finding ourselves in witchy spaces and you know trying not to be put off when a witchy thing doesn't look like it's coded for us yeah that's very true this is all very fair you know and very yeah very reflective and I think yeah I think I I just so for me the frustration lies in I have your pink sparkly thing but when it becomes the dominant aesthetic or there's a crystal on everything or there's something on everything you know it's that kind of coding of something for for a term and for a an acceptance of a kind of role if you like or of a being that is so complex and just in terms of you know representation you know the witch and the figure of the witch is has been so many things and it continues and i and i think that's important about it so yeah a place for sparkly but i would also love to see more of a neutralizing of witchcraft in a way it's getting there for sure and there's been oh, yeah. out there and, and less you know uh this and that but we're still using gendered pronouns to 
you know, talk about witches and we're still, and it's like, come on, like, come on. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes you'll read texts that go, oh, he or she, and it's like, they could be There's right. a word. There is a word you could literally use right now. <laughs> it's one word that you could put in there. Really, there was one covers... word that you could use to express this. Oh, yeah. Oh, Everybody. And, and the thing is with being, you know, like fat witches and, and, and I feel like we have one real representation of that, which which is well, there's a couple for like from the nineties we had uh we had uh grot bags, it was a bit of a niche oh. reference. Um but we you know, we have nanny og, but that's kind yeah, of we've got like the you know, hocus pocus girls here in the States. And oh, like yeah. yeah, that's yeah, yeah. It's it's, kind of... you know, where's the where's the big fat witches? fucking about doing all sorts of mischief or being whimsical or being this or that or being in those ridiculously over sexualized poses on stuff like let's fucking if we're gonna <laughs> fucking let's go for it let's fucking do it you know and and yeah i think the thing for me as well is that the witchcraft is that kind of almost like safety net where you don't have to perform to this patriarchal standard and i think what concerns me is the amount of kind of male gaze or cis male gaze that we get in witchcraft aesthetic which is very much like a kind of guy looking for an alt goth girlfriend sort of thing yeah, it, it yeah. has that vibe sometimes and if that works yeah. for you and that's something that you are doing like anything i mean like you are doing for yourself fantastic but if you're doing it as a part of a kind of pick me thing it just gets a bit like it's it, it's almost like a, a shell that you're enclosing around yourself rather than breaking out of it and engaging i, with I think we can well i mean not to get too conspiracy theorist but i think we know why the emphasis is so very pink and sparkly and aesthetic in witchcraft because if it is pink and sparkly and aesthetic no one has to take it seriously mm. and i think i think if you look i mean if you if you look at algorithms, if you look at what gets seen, if you look at what the social media platforms are showing you, it is the pink, the sparkly, the aesthetic. And I think that we can turn a very critical eye to that and say, all right, is this being shown to us because this is the overwhelming zeitgeist of the witchcraft movement right now? Or are we being shown this because this is kind of what our vision is being nudged towards and for what purpose? Mm -hmm. I, have, I have this concept, it's called the Pinterest effect. My, in a nutshell, Pinterest was made to keep women busy and obsessing over our aesthetic boards so that we don't actually go out and cause some fucking mischief. <laughs> and I, yeah, I think we can, I think we can draw a line from, from that to kind of this, the, the current state of aesthetic witch, witchcraft mm -hmm. is that if we are kept constantly comparing ourselves visually and trying to keep up with the look we don't have time to actually do the work that might actually make a difference mm -hmm. so i mean as as much as i like to you know slag on you know pink sparkly witches and you know stop doing your nails go do some fucking witchcraft um i don't think that we can point the finger solely at other witches just not wanting to do the work. I think oh, there's yeah. definitely a crafting. No, no. But I think I think sometimes it's tempting for us who don't fit that aesthetic to kind of I almost feel like we're being backed into like I'm not like other girls kind of realm again. Like, you know, I think about internalized misogyny a lot. It's very true, like, you, know, you know, know. Where does that come from and who benefits from that? yeah that is very and if they keep us fighting amongst ourselves and slagging each other off we're not going to get together and you know do some actual damage 
And yeah. I think that's, yeah, that's, yeah, very insightful and important to reflect on that and give yourself space for these feelings of like, oh, not another this. But at the same time, be like, uh, and it's fine to have a sort of internal thought, I suppose, and share, you know, here and there, but we're, you know, also letting people be and, you know, knowing that if that's all folks are seeing uh-huh. of the ways to be a witch, then that's what they're going to do do you know what i mean if they're whether that's algorithmic led or whether that's just the the access that they have you know and when i first uh started out took on i i had the most terrible how-to book um it was good in some ways but aesthetically really <laughs> not, yeah wild um but it nonetheless it taught me a lot and um and and it it well I say it took, me, it took me various things that I had to then dive into and go what works what am I interested in what is, you know and yeah and that was you know helpful and at the first time for cleansing when I first started out when you wanted to cleanse anything you burnt white sage that was what it was it was yeah. it was that was it and then you go oh shit no you don't like <laughs> you then maybe look at your local practice and maybe look at, you know, this, that and the other. And some things are, uh, you know, sort of the whole uh, exoticism that occurred in, you know, earlier cultism. Oh, yeah. There's that heritage of grabby hands that occurs. And then you sort of go, oh, hang on a minute. And so until I you love that of... term, by the way, I'm borrowing that. The heritage of grabby hands. <laughs> it's so... If that doesn't yeah. encapsulate, like... British and European empiricism. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, yeah, the wow. grabbing hands and I've definitely seen online and all that, but it's definitely that kind of, for me, it's, it, you know, things like Egyptomania and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm sure at the time it was amazing to have this discovery and like, whoa, unbelievable. But <laughs> unfortunately, it comes at a loss of our local traditions and things like that and I think what is a shame with especially with England and, and the UK as a whole um but England particularly uh because places like Scotland Wales and Ireland have their own sort of traditional side of things there I think it's sort of get a bit clumsy in our usage of the term of, of UK um but there is this lack of desire to look at our own uh folkloric and historic practices and things like that you know and and also just we don't have to use all the words or you use all the things that we can you know fumigation is perfectly fine we don't have to call it something else that's particular to a, a culture or we don't have to use that because it's that thing of like the the performativeness and it and I think that it comes to critical thinking really and it comes to sort of taking a moment to go okay this is what this is is this a hard limit for me to enter into witchcraft or can I squeeze through this kind of awkward passageway to what actually is the path I want to get onto? Do you know what I mean? But that, that, you do have to, you have to grow you have to, and you have to make mistakes and you have to fail a few times and you have to oh. cringe at yourself and, and you know, <laughs> and be clumsy. And, and that's one of those things that sometimes they're the most awkward of things or the most painful of things you go through are actually the most transformative and helpful because you are like, oh, shit, that was a bit grim. I don't want to do that again. Or, oh, that was not necessarily what I want to do now. Okay. I'm, I'm, and but also being like, okay, I know now and taking action. And I think as long as you're doing that sort of like, okay, I know, and you're doing something about it, then that's where it's sort of at for hopefully future progression and things like that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm-hmm. Do you think, they, what do you think then is the sort of future for witchcraft as we go onwards? Oh, I think we're, I think we're very much in kind of, you know, the housing bubble of witchcraft right now. I mean, I think it it's everywhere. It's very visible. It's very much a thing. Everyone is a witch right now. And I think, um, I think within the next, you know, five or six years, I think we'll see. We'll see a tapering off of that and i think that's natural and i think that's fine i think um i think the bubble has definitely helped tremendously those of us who are in it for the long haul who have mm-hmm. been in it um because we can we are much more able to just kind of introduce ourselves hi my name's Haley jane nice to meet you i make soap by the way i'm a witch you know, without it being this whole fucking thing. 
And um, I think it's made it easier for us to find each other outside of and also inside of our local communities. Um, I think that's lovely. I think the, the breadth of um, resources available, if not the depth, I don't know that there's, you know, <laughs> there's been a great deepening of resources during the, the expansion, but it's fine, whatever. You know, there's just, there's a lot more visibility. There's a lot more discussion about it. And I think ultimately that benefits, you know, kind of witchcraft as a whole to kind of demystify, um, de-stigmatize uh, a little bit. And I think, um, yeah, I think, I don't think there's a, I don't think it's coincidence that the resurgence of witchcraft is happening in our current social and political climate. Mm -hmm. um, I will be intrigued to see uh, how that plays out longer term, um, because right now it's very cool and very trendy to call yourself a witch. We'll be curious to see if that if that sticks around or not. Mm -hmm. um, I can see, especially given what is starting to happen here in the United States, I can see it becoming perhaps a little bit more of a liability again mm -hmm. down the road. But you know, that's fine. We will. We'll deal with that when we deal with it. Um, for right now, I think, um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the day when the kids don't think it's cool. When like, oh, witchcraft. Yeah, my mom does that. <laughs> like, I'm looking forward to, to that. You know, when it is just, it is something just intrinsic and every day and Everyone does it in a slightly different way. And I don't know, these big fizzy expansion times are really fun, but I'm looking forward to, looking forward to the middle age of it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, that. kind of that settling into just like comfortable maintenance level a little yes. bit, you know, and kind of having some time to digest all of this material and all of this content um that has surged into view in the last couple of years i think having having a time of contraction to really kind of process all of that and distill out okay what part of that was actually really helpful what was it really useful what was you know really contributing to the quality of our various practices and what can we look at and say okay that was probably not you know what anybody needed but we don't have to carry that along with us. So we'll just, we'll show that, you know. Yeah, I like yeah. that. It's kind of, it makes me think of, you know, when people go, oh, you know, the 80s was the best year for musical, the 90s was the best year for musical, whatever it is, you know. And it's Okay, like, but 1991 <laughs> absolutely slapped for music and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> I'm sorry. I digress. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm constantly accused of, of, uh, of 90s nostalgia, but, uh, <laughs> but, I do think, like, it is that thing of we don't remember the really shit tunes that we just never get on those on those playlists because yeah. they just passed us by, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's the thing with witchcraft. We're kind of in that, we're in the charts, in this, you know, lots of charts. So it would be very interesting yeah. to yeah. see what is the top 10, you know, after this decade or this whatever it is. What is the, what are we kind of, moving towards what we've and also I'd really like to say I think you know like I would like to see the like you say about the sort of the breadth rather than depth I would love to see works being put out there and I, I do see things like Hayden Press and other and other places um where putting out works that are accessible and that have good scholarship um but are reasonably you know priced and and I think that would be yeah. lovely to see because there's <laughs> Unfortunately, there is an inequality in access to good quality knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, that I think that would be nice to sort of see a kind of evening out of the playing field or at least 
more explanatory stuff. I certainly appreciate that, you know, um, podcasts and, and channels, various ones like uh, mm-hmm. Glitchbot and uh, Esoterica and so there's There's got the really good, uh, uh, you know, and Foolish Fish explaining mm-hmm. different things, giving a bit of uh, kind of context, I think is key. But yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, it's toughy. I mean, I've mentioned a couple of, of different uh, channels. There. Are there any, any particular sort of channels or things or, you know, stuff that you want to plug or people you want to mention, you know, a particular a thing yeah. for you in which okay. quality stuff? Um, let's see. Tarot Diagnosis uh, by Shannon Knight. Absolutely delicious podcast mm-hmm. on the intersection of tarot and psychotherapy. As as a psych person, fascinating to see how um, you know just kind of the the roots of the you know kind of whole Jungian archetypes and whatnot um, as they uh, emerge through tarot, but then how we can also use tarot to really um, start doing some hard work on the parts of ourselves that you know we're feeling. A certain way about and uh so that's a delicious podcast and she has lots of different guests on from various and sundry walks of life so it's it's not just her it is this lovely breadth of work um so highly recommend that the tarot diagnosis uh third time's a charm molly dyer witchcraft off the beaten path <laughs> she has a back catalog go listen um She'll she'll make you mad, but she'll be mad there with you. Uh, really love that. Um, I know he's kind of cheesy, but Elliot Adam, Elliot Oracle, yeah, his Fearless Tarot series. Um, I love that he brings a softness and a joyfulness to reading tarot. Um, that I think it's a lovely entry point. I think if um, new practitioners have looked at tarot and been spooked by tarot, because what if I get the death card? Um, he's he's a lovely um, lovely starting point to start dismantling kind of those knee jerk and deeply entrenched views about different cards. And um, really, I think the thing that I really appreciated about him was he really helped open up this idea of tarot really not having fixed rules about interpretation. That at the end of the day, it is a tool for our own interpretation. And if I interpret a card completely different from you, that's fine. That's good. That's okay. That's the point. You know, just kind of chucking out a lot of the rules that, uh, have been passed down with tarot. I really appreciate his work a lot. Nice, yeah, that's yeah. us. Yeah, that was, I was just listening, uh, I've been going back through uh, Hex Positive, free uh, yeah. Nagaran's podcast, and, and they yeah. did a really great episode on tarot and sort of you know, getting through some of the myths of it and stuff like that. And it's just, yeah, context is key. So yeah, thank you for sharing those. That's really, yeah, yeah that's really that's wicked. Cool. Yeah. What about personally? What kind of products are you up to? And, you know, what things are you doing that people can, you know, access you on or, like, engage with and things like that? Well, Paintbox Soapworks at paintboxsoapworks.com is is the soapy ah, soapy hub of everything that I do. Uh, We're in the middle of summer right now, so it's all the summer scents. Um, I don't do uh, the traditional kind of beachy flip-flop sandals kind of. Stuff. so we've got uh got deep dark ocean like i did one last year i was so fried i was so burnt out i just wanted to sink to the bottom of the ocean where i couldn't hear anything no one could touch me the sun doesn't wasn't anywhere near me and so i made a sense about that um we've got some uh like southern gothic stuff going on <laughs> yeah it's it's a good time and then oh my gosh it is the end of june which means i've got about two weeks before i start production on the weenies 
Well, the Halloween stuff, which is my favorite, because yes. am I not a witch? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've got that going on. I'm in the prototype stage of a really great private custom project that I can't really talk about, except that shit. And I love that someone came to me with this absolutely outlandish concept and was like, can you make this real? And entrusted me with that. Like, ah, oh, I just, I love it so much. Um, yeah, I've got that. I am, I'm working, I've got three different posts that I'm kind of pecking away at for my new Substack, which is Here Be Hedge Witches. Um, I'm working on one about um, doing spells that involve other people mm -hmm. and kind of the, the push-pull friction of that. All of this, all of my writing on Here Be Hedge Witches is very much from a personal witchcraft standpoint. It's not a, hey, this is how you should do it and how it is thought of. It's very personal thoughts about that. So it's about me um, doing a spell for our son as he was navigating the college application process. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Um, what else am I working on? Um, well, we're working on the convention yes. for the Critical Thinking Witch Collective. <laughs> That's a big project that we're working on right now. <laughs> Yeah, wild, but I must say I'm excited. You know, uh, and um, just the the meetings that we've got going on right now, all the juicy goodness and all the ideas that are brewing for you know for the conference itself. And um, yeah, yeah, criticalthinkingwitches dot com uh, is the website, and it, it is yeah, it's exciting. I'm excited, and I'm especially so pleased to have you. You know, as a part of it. You know. It just yeah it's so lush because yeah i just think the knowledge that you you know you've clearly got and the, and just the whole the thoughtfulness there's just so much about you to like and and just yeah honestly just really really lush i think um yeah i'm excited i'm excited moreover for the witchcraft community as a whole because uh, as you know it, the conference itself is you know, volunteer run. It's by people who are just witching and doing their own thing in various yeah. ways. Do you know what I mean? It's not um, the kind of usual uh, big name pagan sort of thing, right? And yeah. um, uh, you know, and there are scholarships and stuff like that for people who, who find you know in financial difficulty or anything like that. Um, but you know, generally pretty reasonably priced for for what you know is is a two day or so thing. Um, yeah, so it's it's just exciting because that's the kind of work that I I enjoy seeing because it is accessible. It is the community, creating community in itself. Um, yeah, yeah, it's exciting. And I'm excited to see, you know, what, yeah, what sort of goes on and what comes out of it. And yeah, yeah. all our sort of little witchy hats together in the- <laughs> oh, I love it. And I think as, you know, as solo practitioners, I think it's just so delightful to ha take time to, be in a community, even if it's a virtual community, because this is an online only convention. Um, and you would think, oh, like, okay, it's just like a bunch of squares on Zoom. How how powerful can this be? Um, the opening ritual and spell that we did last year, I mean, I don't think any of us were prepared for just the level of impact that that had because like you're sitting there in front of your computer screen you just you do a little chat it's about how what is this going to be and like it was so powerful and so moving and just really I think blew the doors wide for a weekend of like really authentic connection with other witchy people and i think that's what i love about this conference so much is that it's not just sitting here listening to freaking talking heads all weekend it's so much community it's so much interaction um the the bar for entry and participation is pretty much on the ground just don't be a dick that's really the only 
other than that, you know, I just, I love that people can rock up and share about their witch practice at any level from pretty much any perspective and be met with, you know, enthusiasm and respect and curiosity. It's just, it's such a, it's such a magical, such a magical thing. And I love so much that y'all have done the work to get this moving. And I'm so honored to be part of it. Oh, mate, honestly, yeah, I mean, it's the same because, you know, the first year I was a speaker and then coming into the organizing team in the second year was just, it was wild to see how much work goes on you know in the background and it's not just this idea that just all this thing that has happened so much happened and it, but you know speaking to the event itself like you say I'm, I'm really glad the ritual came across that way because you know I know myself and, and Alex from up which you punks and pbw uh, witch shop uh, dot com you know that there's something that was really sort of a yeah something that was important to try and set that kind of tone and be like hey let's let's come in let's share let's be all in this together so to speak to use a kind of cheesy phrase but it, it, what I think is so great is like you say no matter what your school level is no matter who you are or what you're doing you're going to come away with like something from that that you wouldn't have had before uh, or you might have had to discover further in the future and I think there have been so many little moments where it's just somebody says something even like the smallest thing and I'm like oh that is that is just yeah that bubbles my call and i love it like that's you know yeah. and then you're scribbling the notes and you're checking the google and you're like no this is great this is what i can actionably use in my practice yeah, yeah it's yeah. not just like dust it's not all just dusty history and like well this is this is how things are yeah. it is here's how things can be here's how things could be for your practice is this something that gets you excited? And then we're going to talk about it. Yeah, I love it. So good. Yeah, lush, man. Oh, oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'll be there. I'm very excited. It's my beauty yeah. as well. I feel like this has been like a long time coming, really. And, and just, I really appreciate your support and everything over the, you know, of these. And just, just whenever I see your engagement with the channel, when you comments or anything, you know, and, and just, uh, just a lovely word you have to say. Um, you know, I do struggle with compliments, and <laughs> and, and it's, I know it's nice. <laughs> well, those things are hard, but I just yeah, it's really meaningful, and you've definitely helped me keep doing the magical thing. Uh, right. You know, and keeping it as something that is, you know, even if I've had tough times in terms of being able to put stuff out there, um, just knowing that there is that supportive you know there's those that support there is so important and i know there are a lot of people as well who've just left comments very kind comments and things like that who have been patiently waiting so thank you so much for just all you bring um and yeah and for your time as well today Absolutely. It's such no, this has been a delight i have been ah i love that i can come off of a conversation like this and I know that I'm going to log out. I'm going to be like, all right, here we go. What else can I do? Because this is, this is so, it's so empowering. It fizzes me up so much. And just so appreciate it. Thank you. Well, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Uh, no, but uh, you should, if you're watching this, you should go watch the rest of Do the Magical Thing because it's fucking quality and we love it. Let's see. thank you so much mate well health and wealth everybody and uh and yeah check out the other do the magical thing with series we've got Bree, we've got geordie rich on there as well uh and we've got some future guests coming up too so yeah health and wealth and thank you